anything. They wanted to sulk in silence, if only because it bothered the hell out of Turdo, as the women had taken to calling him. Juan kept fawning over Boudreau and the rest. At one point, Maria happened to walk past him and let loose a low, rapid stream of Spanish that sounded like a lot of dirty words to Amy. Juan cringed and scuttled away. Amy was sympathetic to Juan's plight. He was eligible for the next beating if Jimmy James and Patrick weren't around. He was also the next one in line to get sent out into the wasteland if the mercenaries decided to get rid of anybody else. Juan would do anything to avoid that fate. Maybe even join the cause of his captors. As it happened, the next victim was a woman. It began at dawn with the screaming of the usually silent baby. Amy bolted out of the chair she was sleeping in. The baby was at the far end of the dormitory. Amy dashed down the aisle between the bunks and found the child alone in bed, wiggling his little arms and legs, his face a red puckered ring around the screaming toothless mouth. The bedclothes were rumpled and still warm, but his mother was not there. By now, most of the women had gathered to see what was going on. Amy shoved through them. They would handle the baby somehow. She didn't know what to do except offer him a glass of water. She ran out of the room. There was no guard by the exterior door, only an empty chair. Amy tried to think what was happening. The washrooms. She turned on her heels and ran down the stairs toward the aviatrix's room, taking the steps three at a time. The door was jammed shut. Amy shoved hard, shoved again. She could hear chair legs shuddering over the slick floor tiles. She kicked the door and it squeaked open another inch. Now she could get her hand through the gap. She felt the back of a plastic stacking chair wedged under the door handle. Shook it free and swung the door open, just as Murdo and Ace came racing down from the men's dormitory, guns in hand, wearing their cargo pants but no shirts or boots. They could all see inside the bathroom. They all saw the same thing. Murdo wasn't going to be able to play this one as a he said, she said, because Cammy was jammed up in the corner by the paper towel dispensers, and he, the flamingo, was crushed up against her, one hand twisted down at her groin, the other at her throat. The woman was terrified, the whites showing all the way around her eyes. She looked at Amy and there was pleading on her face, but silent pleading, because the flamingo was choking her silent. Amy didn't make a plan. She simply grabbed the plastic chair, raised it over her left shoulder, and charged. She swung it at the pink-skinned, pink-haired man, her eyes fixed on the back of his neck. I hope I kill him, Amy thought, and an instant later the chair wasn't in her hands. She careened into the man, his hard muscles unyielding, and because the chair was gone, she was off balance and fell. She was back up on her knees within half a second. Flamingo hadn't even turned all the way around. Amy started punching, aiming for his legs, his crotch, anything to stop him. He kicked her away before she landed a single worthwhile blow, and then strong hands were dragging her backward. Ace towed Amy along the floor with one hand twisted into her hair and the other hand shoving his pistol in her face. She could smell the tang of the gun oil. She was spitting with fury, injustice like a cliff towering above her, and she wanted to smash it down. Flamingo, she saw, had turned to Murdo. Murdo was holding the chair he'd pulled out of Amy's hands. There was a crazy daisy sticker on the chair. Flamingo had his back to Cammy, his hands held out to Murdo, shaking his head in a now-let's-be-reasonable kind of way, a bashful little smile on his pie-bald face. It might have ended there. Boys will be boys, everybody back to your own beds. Except Cammy's foot appeared from behind Flamingo with the suddenness of a magic trick in the fork between his legs. His trouser legs jumped halfway up his shins, the blow made a noise like a preacher whacking his Bible in mid-sermon. That's for Patrick, you asshole, Cammy shouted. Flamingo went down in slow motion, his neck rigged with tendons like a schooner in a high wind, teeth bared, eyes bulging. Ace let go of Amy's hair. One moment Cammy was there, blazing with life, tall with defiance, the next moment there was a crisp, ear-splitting report that buzzed off the tiles, 
and the wall behind Cammy was blooming with red roses. Her head snapped back and she fell to the floor, dead. Flamingo lay on his side, clutching his testicles, while the blood flowed out of Cammy in the shape of a monstrous red hand, its fingers crawling along the grout lines, oozing toward the fallen man, as if to avenge its dead. Amy looked away. Jones was leaning against the doorframe, his wounded leg held stiffly at an angle in front of him. His face was sheet-rumpled, his hair awry. He stared at the bloody scene, then spoke to Murdo. Sir, what the fuck is going on? 8. Danny tried to shout, but her voice was gone along with her strength. She didn't want herself or Liz Magnuson to die at the teeth of the undead wolf pack that was encircling them. Her mind was still tumbling around from the crack on the head she'd received. Magnuson, oblivious to the approaching danger, continued to curse out loud. She put two shots from her Luger into one of the sluggish undead by the M-Rap that Danny's grenade hadn't blown apart. The others were motionless, or struggling with shattered limbs, unable to attack. Danny croaked, then tried again. It sounded more like the zombie moan than anything else. She tried to wave her hands. One of them lifted up a few inches, then fell back. She turned her protesting neck to follow how far the hunter zeros had gotten in their careful stalking of their live prey. There was one eight feet away from Danny. It was so close she could hear the rustle of its scabby tongue behind yellow teeth. The thing was looking directly at her with frost-dimmed eyes. When it saw her, it froze in position, knees bent, one leg forward, both arms held crookedly out before it with fingers extended. It stood like that, motionless for several seconds. Then it scented the air like an animal, hooking its shrunken nose into the dawn breeze. It smells me, Danny thought. She was helpless. It had her. The zero moved, but not toward Danny. It hunched down low and slunk away to the next position of concealment, behind a dusty hatchback. Danny's heart flooded with emotion. It saw her and didn't want to eat her. It smelled her and moved on. She could hardly move, and her throat would not speak. An evil thought came to her. If the thing didn't attack, she must already be one of them. Yet she felt pain, not hunger. She felt fear for the living woman who was now up the ladder of the MRAP, shouting her disgust at the stench inside the cab. Get in and shut the door, you stupid bitch, Danny screamed inside herself. She tried to make the words come out, but her vocal cords were unstrung and she could only gasp, sucking in a throatful of putrid gas. Then Danny understood why she herself was still alive. She was soaked in the sludge of the far rotten soldier's corpse. She stank so powerfully it would make a graveyard rat puke. On her, the zombie couldn't smell the living breath, the warmth of her blood. It could only smell its own decaying kind. Danny bent her eyes toward the cougar M-Rap. Magnuson didn't get into the cab, having discovered the same unbearable filth that had knocked Danny back. Instead, she waved her hands around to clear the flies from her face and started searching the pavement for something, maybe a rag to wipe up the rotten guts on the front seat. She kept an eye on the nearest of the shuffling, slow zeros that were making their way toward her, but Danny had cleared a considerable radius with the explosion. Magnuson thought she had plenty of time. What Magnuson was not anticipating, because you wouldn't fucking listen, shouted the voice inside Danny's head, was the stealthy approach of undead with fast reflexes, hunting instincts, and the ability to use concealment to get close to their prey. Several others of the stalking pack had moved within twenty feet of the cougar. Magnuson had something less than fifteen seconds to get inside that vehicle and slam the door. If she did, she was safe as houses. She was surrounded by inch-thick steel plate, triple bulletproof glass, and a variety of armaments and survival gear. Who gives a shit what it smells like in the name of God, Danny shouted silently. Get in! Danny tried again to wave her companion away, to get her attention. 
and this time she was able to lift both hands. Life was returning to her limbs. She wasn't dead. Her body was only rebooting. She still couldn't speak. Then she had an idea. Danny dragged her numb fingers around behind her belt, knuckles scraping on the pavement, and groped them across the tattered band of leather, looking for the satellite radio. It was gone, but there was a single pipe grenade left. She willed her fingers to close around it, and they did, in the same slow, imprecise way as the artificial hands she'd seen at the veterans' rehab center when she was learning to use her legs again. She got the grenade clear of the belt and pulled her arm around by force of will until she could grasp the pipe with both hands. She probably couldn't throw it far enough to avoid killing herself, but she didn't particularly relish surviving much longer anyway. This was a better way to die. There were six or seven of the hunting zombies gathered behind vehicles all around Magnuson now, and Danny couldn't figure out why her companion hadn't seen them. But she knew the answer already. Because she doesn't believe in them, of course. Danny turned her eyes to the grenade. She gathered her will, sending conscious commands to her arms. She pulled the fuse wire with all the force she could muster, and it didn't move. She pulled again, and now that her arms were familiar with the orders, they yanked apart and the wire came smartly out of the grenade. There was a little whiff of fuse smoke that nipped inside Danny's nostrils, breaking through the stench of corpses. This was it. If things went the way she thought they might, she was about to be blown apart, either by dimes or ball bearings. She preferred dimes if given a choice. Classier. She turned her body like a rusty spring and threw the grenade as hard as she could. To Danny's surprise, the missile sailed briskly into the air and clanked down among the cars, not far from a pair of the crouching zeros. Magnuson heard the noise and turned, pistol raised, searching with her eyes. Danny tried once more to shout. At last, Magnuson saw the zombies. They broke cover at the same moment, oblivious to the importance of the grenade, but recognizing their quarry was alerted to them. Silent as lions, they came on, jaws open. Magnuson fired three shots in rapid succession, pivoting her arm straight out in front of her to sweep the pack as it charged. One of the things went heavily down, then the rest were upon her. She screamed, a low, angry cry, that honeyed singer's voice lending melody even to this. The Zero slammed her against the hull of the MRAP. Danny couldn't see clearly. Magnuson was obscured between the fenders of the vehicle. Danny saw the monsters grabbing her arms, biting, trying to tear through the leather. How long had it been since she threw the grenade? Five seconds? Six? It seemed as if ten minutes had passed since the fuse had flared to life. Magnuson had one arm free of her tormentors and was shouting, swinging a brain pick side to side. She nailed one of the things, caught it in the head, and it fell, its legs kicking as if electrified. But now Magnuson's hands were empty. Another of the undead lunged in, teeth flashing, and she was shoved back completely out of sight, and her hoarse shouts turned to a high, gurgling whistle. Danny was too far away to tell if it was human blood or zombie ink, but something squirted through the air. Seven. Eight. The grenade exploded. A blazing automobile door sailed high overhead and crashed down out of sight beyond Danny's position. She blinked as the explosion drove a wave of hot, gritty air into her face. The MRAP rocked back on its wheels, then lurched down again. Cars burst into flame. Gasoline tanks ruptured and blew. Black, greasy smoke coiled into the light of the newly risen sun, which was burning a bright crescent into the eastern horizon of rooftops. One of the undead hunters stumbled out of the smoke, flames clamoring over its ragged flesh. It stumbled, sought balance against a car, then continued. Eventually the thing fell down and struggled and lay still. Danny drove the Humvee along the obstacle course of the freeway, away from San Francisco. She bowled the heavy truck through the smaller vehicles. This wasn't detail work. She simply had to make some distance. The military hummers were equipped with an on-off switch, not keys, 
so it had been the work of a few seconds to get the machine running and maneuver her way into the maze of motionless vehicles. All along her route she saw the hunting undead, dozens of them at first, then hundreds, then thousands of these alert, swift-moving zeros, all swarming in the direction of the city and its stench of living things. The sun was not long up in the sky when she saw another phenomenon that made her pull up onto an overpass raised on concrete pillars high in the air. Half Moon Bay Road, the sign said. She stopped the Humvee. She was fairly safe inside the vehicle, which had a fully enclosed cab, but it was extremely dangerous to be out in the open. There was a backpack on the floor of the passenger side. Danny found a couple of vacuum-packed meals in there, a copy of Car and Driver, two clips of 9 millimeter ammunition, and a pair of compact binoculars. Danny checked her position carefully before she emerged, the overpass giving her a commanding view of several miles of road in both directions. She climbed up on the roof, carefully because her legs were weak as a newborn foal's, and sighted through the binoculars. Danny didn't know exactly where she was. The road was on high ground. Downhill from the freeway were master-planned subdivisions, identical houses on streets that branched into ever smaller streets, like limbs on a tree. Beyond that was the bay. On the other side was a long, narrow reservoir fringed with trees. It butted up against forested hills. Danny had seen something happening out among the houses that made her wonder. She saw it for mile after mile and still couldn't comprehend it. So now she searched the distant streets with the binoculars. They were there. The figures she discerned were tiny this far away, but she could see they were upright, human, the undead. In some places there were one or two of them. In other places, hundreds had gathered. They were all facing north, all of them. Danny sought out the nearest streets, not far from her elevated position, and there were more of them there. She feathered the focus ring, and now she could see the faces of the nearest ones. They were chomping, or rather, they were clacking their jaws. They looked like wooden puppets, nutcrackers, mouths snapping open and shut. Now she thought she could even hear the sound, which she had originally believed to be the rustling of grass. It was the snapping of hundreds of thousands of hungry teeth, all biting at the air, all facing north, all aimed toward the city. 9. Since the incident that morning, Murdo was never without a pistol in his hand. Discipline with his men had broken down completely by midday. They were arguing among themselves. There was a fistfight between Ace and Parker, Ace accusing Parker of siding with the slain woman because she was half-coon. Murdo brooded alone in the control tower for several hours. The civilians were rounded up and locked down in the dining room, with guards on every exit. It was Reese and Boudreaux who carried Cammie out of the ladies' room, wrapped in a plastic drop cloth, her bloodless yellow-gray feet protruding from the polyethylene. Maria demanded to know what they were going to do with her. She's dead, Boudreaux replied, as if Maria was suggesting necrophilia. They wrestled the bound corpse across the parking lot, threading between their hulking vehicles. Estevez unlocked the gates, and they carried Cammy's body away out into the scrubland. Both men came running back into the compound within a minute and a half, reporting to their compatriots before Reese trotted up into the conning tower to inform Murdo. None of the civilians could see what the fuss was about, but the normally macho men were clearly shaken. The dining room was on the runway side of the building. None of the windows looked out on the front gates. As it was, the civilians didn't have long to wait before the news reached them. Estevez climbed into the M1117 ASV and manned the gun turret, and when Murdo came down out of the tower, he shouted, Zeros! and pointed out into the desert. There were gunshots. Several of the survivors got down on the floor. Pfeiffer posted a lookout by the window. They're shooting outside the fence, she said. Minutes later, the mercenaries came back in, this time with Murdo among them, chest out, head thrown back. They had their old swagger back, as if they'd been out hunting bear. You'll be glad to know, 
Murdo said in a too loud, expansive voice. We took care of about ten zeros that were on their way here for the free buffet. He looked around at the civilians as if he expected them to thank him. He met the hostile eyes and took a step backward, then drew himself up to his modest full height. Let's all try to remember that we had an accident here, an unfortunate accident, but now we saved all your lives. We did it without hesitation. We did it without making any demands out of you people. We did our duty as sworn contractors to the United States government, if any. I didn't come back in here expecting to be hailed as a conquering hero, but I do expect you people to show some fucking respect for the men who just saved your asses. By the end of his speech, his face was red, and he had his head thrust forward again in that characteristic belligerent posture, that was his natural stance. Nobody spoke for a few seconds. Then Linda Moss, who seemed to have found some inner fire, stood up and raised her hand. Without waiting to be acknowledged by Murdo, she said, Were they attracted by the smell of fresh meat? Was it the body out there? You creeps didn't even bury her, did you? We didn't have time, Reese shouted at the top of his lungs. His hand rose up to rest on the pommel of his automatic. Murdo stepped in front of Reese with his back to the civilians. You listen here, Murdo said to Reese, but for the general audience. These people are spoiled, soft, and ungrateful. Civilians are like that everywhere in the world. They don't know the cost in blood, sweat, and tears it takes to bring peace to a troubled land, you hear me? By now, Murdo was inches from Reese, looking up into the taller man's face with glittering bloodshot eyes. Now you and me, we get no respect. We're not Army, we're not Marines or Air Force or Navy. Murdo stepped back so he could take in all his men with an encompassing look, warming to his speech. He placed his hand on Reese's arm and squeezed. Hell, we're not even National Guard. This got a laugh out of the mercenaries. Murdo continued, on a roll now. We're plain old Americans, except we have a code a code of discipline and loyalty and duty. In all this excitement, hell, we made some mistakes. Freedom isn't free. But, here he thrust a blunt finger heavenward, the highest authority will forgive us what happens on the bloody fields of war, because it's not the dead that mourn, it's the living. Let's remember that. We mourn the dead. Fuck if I'm not mourning the dead right now, right here in my heart, and I will kill the first cocksucker says otherwise. So what happens now? Amy asked. This speech of his was leading somewhere. Murdo ground a fist into his other hand. I'll tell you what happens now. We're pulling out, he announced. Too many zeros. This is no longer a secure location. The sun was setting behind a mass of thick, shapeless cloud low on the horizon. The sky was shot through with faded purple and scratches of bright orange, as the light drowned and the world fell into darkness. Supplies had been hurried into vehicles over the course of the afternoon, with most of the edible stuff going into the ASV and the back of a Humvee controlled by the Hawkstone men. As a concession, some food was left in the RV so the civilians could eat on the road. Toilet paper, batteries, and the first aid materials, whatever occurred to people, were piled up around Patrick's bed in the motorhome. The urgency of the situation wasn't clear to anybody but Murdo. Amy thought he must be going stir-crazy, and this was his way of dealing with it. There were undead out there in growing numbers, but she thought the living were safer at the airfield, at least until morning. Who knew what would happen out there in the dark? But she kept her own counsel and did what she was told to do, like everyone else. Once the vehicles were loaded to Murdo's satisfaction, the survivors were marched double-time to the White Whale. Murdo ordered them to halt at the door. You and you, he said, indicating Reese and Estevez. Throw the fag out. Put him over there. Amy surprised herself by shouting as loudly as she could, No, he's not even conscious. Murdo turned to her with his eyes strangely blank. I don't give a sideways fuck what he is. I'm not having another wounded on this bus. Jones is all we can handle. Reese, Estevez, do it. At least, 
Amy said, her voice quaking. Bring him inside the building. Reese and Estevez muscled the unconscious body into the terminal. They were going to dump Patrick on the floor a foot inside the front door, but Amy barked, Upstairs! And rather than argue, they carried him up the steps and tossed him on a bed in the men's dormitory. Amy tried to arrange Patrick's limbs in a restful pose, then threw a blanket over him. Okay, Reese said when Amy didn't move from Patrick's bedside. Let's go. What the fuck, man? Estevez said, looking to Reese. Let's get the fuck out of here. Let's go, Reese repeated to Amy. Come on, man, we ain't got a whole shitload of time. Estevez slapped Reese on the arm. Reese turned on Estevez. She's the fucking doctor, man. We gotta take the doctor with us. She don't need to stay here nursing boy George. Amy had an inspiration, beautiful in its simplicity. I'm not a doctor, she said. I'm a veterinarian. That got them. Bullshit, Estevez said. You sewed up Jones. Same as a dog, except taller, Amy said. Serious? Reese asked. I'm a horse doctor, Amy said. The men looked confused. Reese pointed in the direction of the parking lot. Go tell Murdo, he said to Estevez. Maybe she ain't shit. She was an animal doctor. Nothing more. Murdo was embarrassed, and that made him angry. The refugees in the motorhome had gotten a huge laugh out of it. Murdo couldn't believe they were laughing at him, of all people, who held their lives in his hand. Like that cocksucker who threw the shoes at the president a while back, and everybody thought he was a hero. So what if Jones got doctored by an animal expert? It was all meat, right? But Murdo still felt the blush flaring away in his face. Maybe he should shoot the bitch, teach them a lesson. But he had a feeling if there was one more act of violence like that, these people would no longer come along easily. Tell you what, Murdo said to Estevez, we're gonna leave her here like she wants, but on our way out, we're gonna chain the gates to the ASV, rip them off the hinges, and drag them a mile down the road. Then let's see if the lady veterinarian thinks it's so funny when all the zeros come pouring in looking for chow. What do you say? I say hells to the yeah, Estevez replied. So the engines were fired up on the M1117 armored security vehicle and the two Humvees. Ace piloted one of the Humvees around in a broad circle until it was up behind the White Whale, which was the only civilian vehicle they were taking. Reese got back in beside Molini in the cab of the motorhome. Murdo was in the ASV because he was the boss. Parker was at the controls. Jones was laid out in the back of the second Humvee. It took Flamingo five minutes to get down the terminal stairs. His testicles were so sore. Boudreaux shot a couple of nearby zeros, unlocked the big gates, and swung them open. He had 30 feet of chain ready to attach the gates to the ASV when the time came. The next nearest undead were probably five minutes out in the desert, maybe less. The convoy was ready to go as soon as Flamingo quit fucking around. He was trying to urinate against the side of Hangar 1. What the fuck, asshole? Murdo said, climbing down out of the ASV. I can't piss, Flamingo said. It feels like I gotta go, but I can't. She busted my dick. You got ten seconds to stow your junk, Flamingo, then we roll. The night was swallowing up the world, cold and dark. There was a wind rising. Murdo thought he could hear the moaning of the zeros out there in the dark, barren country. Then he thought he could hear an engine. Murdo turned to face the road, and Boudreau was watching as well. There were headlights bouncing along out there in the distance. Coming down the road for the airfield. The vehicle couldn't have been headed anywhere else because there was nowhere else. Moments later, they watched a grime-coated, candy-apple-red 1968 Mustang Roll to a stop a hundred feet from the gates. 10. Danny's ass was sore. So was everything else. But she was relieved to be back on the road to Boscombe Field. The return trip to the Mustang had been problem-free, 
but she was troubled by the thought of what was happening back in San Francisco. They might not have attacked yet, but those zeros with their canine intelligence and their silent, crouching stealth were going to overrun the defenses. There was no question. The urban core was surrounded by a perimeter of wire and rubble and cars. This barricade was designed to keep out rotting, two-legged things as stupid and single-minded as sharks. These new ones were cunning. They could work together in packs. They were exponentially faster and smarter than the ones Danny had encountered in the hotel in Potter, and there were hundreds of thousands of them. She was afraid to speculate on how much further the living dead would evolve before the virus that animated them decided it was finished improving its kill ratio. Would the Zeros someday be able to communicate? Use weapons? If that happened, the living would be destroyed. To confront an opponent that could think but felt no pain, no fear, and was incapable of mercy? That meant extinction. Danny decided to ditch the Humvee in favor of the Mustang. She had all kinds of reasons for this, but the truth was she couldn't leave the Mustang behind. It represented everything. The last vestige of Kelly's trail, the last vestige of Danny's attempts at a real life. And it was such a sweet ride. Danny didn't have a lot of pleasures left. The 302 V8 might be the last of them. That and the bourbon. Danny allowed herself a few pulls on a fresh fifth, but didn't drink herself stupid the way she had on the road north. She was on her way back to known things now, and there was refuge in it. She wouldn't need the bottle for company, merely the occasional sip, enough to take the edge off the pain that a handful of Vicodin couldn't get to. Danny took a few more chances before she lit out again. She was there at the seaside where she'd left the Mustang. It was exactly as she had left it some days before. The coast was deserted. Climbing into her beloved vehicle wearing such stinking, filth-saturated clothing seemed blasphemous. She wondered if Zeros could swim. The beach was empty, and the nearby marina and the motel, the boatyard, and all the little houses. She had swept the area for Zeros previously, and none seemed to have wandered in since. She had never been so alone. The water would be cruelly cold. But you only live once, she thought. If you're lucky, the voice said. Danny stripped off her clothes and raced her battered body into the creaming surf. Despite the frigid water and a persistent worry that the severed head she'd seen at Fisherman's Wharf would rise up from the bottom and bite her on the ass, she floundered around in the surf for almost half an hour. She scampered back out of the water only once to retrieve her long-suffering boots and swish them through the water over and over, scooping up the sea and pouring it out again until the leather lost its slimy feel and they smelled like nothing except ocean. Then she swam for the sheer joy of swimming. When she emerged from the sea, she felt thoroughly alive. Her limbs were numb so they didn't ache. The thick mat of scars that covered her back seemed to enjoy salt water, its astringency softening the raw hide until it almost felt like skin again. The air was a lot colder than she remembered it, and she didn't have a towel, or any clothes at all, unless she wanted to put on the reeking garbage she'd been wearing before. She scanned the area around her. It was truly deserted, this little seasonal village tucked between the sea and the headlands. Fuck it. Danny arranged her boots to drain onto the sand, then walked up the beach, stark naked. Between the scars and the bruises, she figured anybody who saw her from a distance would think she was wearing a tie-dyed wetsuit. Besides, wasn't the world getting beyond modesty now? It didn't matter if you were clothed or naked, only if you were alive or dead. It didn't matter if your thighs were laced with surgical scars and your back looked like the surface of Neptune, just so long as you were a human being. Still, she hoped nobody would see her. Danny walked along the strand until she came to a surf shop. For protection, she was carrying the tiller off a derelict sailboat. It would make a handy club. Although there was light overcast, she thought she was getting sunburned. And then she thought, not on your back you aren't. And she laughed to herself. She laughed out loud. It sounded like gunshots. She was quiet again. The surf shop was unlocked. She went in, stilling the bell at the top with her fingers so it wouldn't jingle. 
She found some cargo shorts and a long-sleeved tee with a cartoon shark holding a surfboard on it. She scuffed on a pair of flip-flops. They were no good for running, though. She found a sleek pair of surf shoes in her size and tried those on. She'd always thought they looked stupid, like ballet slippers. But now that she had them on, they were quite nice, snug and light, with a sole as thin as an extra layer of skin on her foot. Danny didn't look much like a cop now. If, on her journey, she met people, she would prefer to have whatever authority a uniform could convey. It was shorthand for take me seriously. Then she thought there might be a police station here. Summer cops for when the crowds showed up to go boating and lie in the sun. Anyway, she didn't fancy running into any of the agile zombies in her current costume. She hadn't had to fight in slippers before. Danny made her way down the lone street in town, past the shuttered-up beachware shops, the art gallery with its driftwood sculptures and whale paintings, never to be admired again. There was a real estate agency with the usual for sale sign on the door. She found what she was looking for without encountering anything that moved, except a seagull that watched her from atop a telephone pole. Her objective was a tiny building of concrete blocks. One door, one window, garage on the side. She said a silent prayer for forgiveness and lobbed a rock through the window of the Madras Bay Police and Beach Safety Department. Half an hour later, she was gunning the Mustang up the hill out of town, attired in a fresh tan uniform. The arm patches said only police. It was cut to fit a man, and the pants were three inches too long. But Danny tucked the cuffs into her soggy boots and looked enough like a cop so she could almost imagine she had her dignity back. She buckled on her heavy police belt and pistol. Better yet, all that remained was to tuck Kelly's letter, secure in a plastic sandwich bag, into her breast pocket. Danny buttoned it up. As she drove back to the highway, Danny thought of the scene she'd observed from the overpass outside the city. Thousands of zeros, jaws working in concert with each other, like the realization of some shared instinct, something locked up since before mankind stood on its hind legs, possibly so ancient it came from a time before animals walked at all. Why did the undead chomp the air like that? The sight of so many monsters clacking their sinewy jaws together reminded Danny of armies on a medieval battlefield, beating their shields with their spears as they marched to the slaughter. The Zeros might have been anticipating the kill, tearing at warm throats in what was left of their imaginations. But those things couldn't imagine, could they? Danny rejected the idea. They couldn't create or build or grow. They were only capable of destruction, however clever they became. So it must have been those things in their thousands were warming up for the kill, nothing more. How many of them would taste fresh meat? How many would rot away of hunger because there were no more living things to destroy? Danny was driving toward the sunset. She was worried now. She hadn't been able to contact Boscombe Field by the police radio in her glove box. It didn't necessarily mean anything. If things were quiet, they might have stopped monitoring the radio, but she would much have preferred to hear from them in advance of her arrival. There was a massive bank of clouds on the horizon, stealing the sun away before its time. She turned off onto Ore Creek Highway, and her pulse picked up a little. She was avoiding thoughts of Amy and Patrick and the rest, Topper and Ernie, Maria on the radio, Troy Huppert, the city fireman. They might all be dead overrun by the undead while she was gone, but she didn't think so. Behind that fence with supplies and soft beds, and so far from major human settlements, they should be fine. They'd be pissed off at her, of course, and she would have to act contrite, but they'd get over it. It hadn't been that long since Danny left. What could possibly have gone wrong? A few miles of blacktop, the night coming down like an opera curtain. By the fading light, she saw zeros wandering in the desert. They were going the same way she was. The flat desert floor seemed to have become a kind of caravan route for the things. That couldn't be good. There weren't as many as up there in San Francisco. There weren't enough people within 200 miles of here, but there were a hell of a lot of them. They were the slow kind, she thought. They didn't have any coordination, and they didn't crouch walk or attempt to keep out of sight. 
But then, she didn't know if the fast ones reserved their stalking technique for the kill. They might shamble along like all the others until prey came along. Danny had to force her foot up off the gas pedal. She was driving much too fast for such a poorly maintained road. Then she saw lights in a hollow of the dark line of hills, and before long she could see the airfield. She slowed down. The yard of the airfield was brilliantly lit by pole-mounted fixtures. Lights meant life. That was good. Then, as she approached, she saw military vehicles in formation, lined up to drive out through the gates, including one of the thick, gun-turreted M1117 Guardian ASVs. Almost immune to attack, those were, except they had a distinct tendency to flip over on their backs because of a high center of gravity. Behind that was a Humvee, then the motorhome, then another Humvee. Regardless, Danny would have driven right through the open gates to meet them, except she was now close enough to see the camouflage with which the vehicles were painted. Her blood went cold and thin. Hawkstone. Murdo crammed in next to Estevez in the turret of the ASV and watched as a cop stepped out of the vintage Mustang. A lady cop. She stood by the car, left the door open. Cautious type. She must be the one the civilians talked about like she was the Queen of Sheba for getting them to the airfield alive. She was here precisely in time to fuck things up even further. The cop walked toward them, a dozen feet in front of the Mustang, but no closer. Estevez, you be ready to open up that big gun, you hear? Murdo said softly. I don't need this shit. Murdo clambered back through the hull of the ASV and lowered himself down to the ground from the side hatch, pulled his uniform straight. Then he walked across toward Boudreaux and stood in the middle of the gate, arms folded. You better come in, he called to the cop. Shitload of zeros out there. His voice was pitched loud to cover the distance between them. I saw them, the cop replied in a big voice accustomed to authority. I'd like to speak to someone there. I'm the one in charge, Murdo said. What he didn't know was what to do next. The cop had no authority in this time of privatized martial law. He could kill her on the spot. He probably would. But he wanted to make sure she hadn't come from headquarters with fresh news. Could be the rest of the world was already on the rebound, and they were sitting in the desert kicking each other in the nuts for no good reason. I'm looking for Amy Cutter. She's a doctor, Danny said. The short, thick man spat on the ground. The tall man with the prize fighter's face shook his head. She had definitely stepped in something. Danny was mortally afraid for Amy. She realized she had pinned the hopes she'd lost of ever seeing Kelly again on seeing Amy again instead, which was not very smart. Hope didn't get you through. The short man spoke again after thinking a while. You mean the veterinarian? She left. She was here, but she left. We're relocating to command headquarters, so you need to get out of our way. Danny couldn't see the motorhome clearly, shielded as it was by the blaze of the brilliant headlamps of the ASV. But she didn't recognize whoever was sitting in the driver's seat. She thought she might be making a very serious mistake standing out here in the open. There was a man on the 20-millimeter cannon in the turret of the security vehicle, and these others were armed as well. There was a big fifty on the roof of the foremost Humvee. Also, Danny could hear the moaning. There were undead moving through the dark brush all around her. They would be changing course, heading in her direction. This was going to have to be a short conversation one way or the other. She tried again, guessing where headquarters would be for this man. I was just in San Francisco, she said. It's gone. Bullshit, he said, but Danny could tell he was rattled. The zombies, the zeros, are getting faster, she added. You're a world-class bullshitter, the man said. Danny didn't feel like pursuing that line of discussion. Look, mister, she said, if Amy Cutter left, where is everybody else? They in the whale? The whale? The man was looking at his comrade now. They were whispering. The motorhome there, Danny amended. You're taking it. I'd like to see who's inside. 
They all left, Murdo said. I'm Sheriff Adelman. Who are you? Squad Leader Murdo, Hawkstone Security. So, Murdo, Danny said, pronouncing his name like it was stuck to her boot. What I want to know is this. Under what authority have you taken control of this location? What have you done with the civilians? We're on American soil. These are American citizens. They got some rights, and you got some restrictions. Posse comitatus and shit. Murdo shook his head. The entire fucking nation is under martial law, Sheriff. Section 1076. Posse comitatus is suspended. Don't blow smoke up my ass, Danny said, anger giving her voice wings. She wanted to go right up there and get eyeball to eyeball with this prick. Maybe even shoot him. That crap was repealed in 08. I know the law. You don't know shit. Murdo scuffed the ground with his toe, then laughed. It sounded like an effort. I'm gonna give you count of ten to decide whether you're coming or going, okay? We're on a timetable. He pantomime tapped his watch. Then he whispered something to the gunner in the turret of the ASV. The gunner nodded and hunched over his weapon. Danny knew the posture well. He was braced to open fire. At that moment, the terminal door banged open and Amy came hammering out of the building, shouting and waving her arms. Danny's heart squeezed halfway up her throat. Amy was alive. She was right there, and these bug fuckers were in the way. Danny, go! Go, go, go! Amy shouted, and now one of the uniformed men was running at her from the Humvee, and Amy was down on the ground. Fury burst inside Danny's head. Her friend was being attacked, and she couldn't do anything about it. In fact, she needed to retreat now. That upgraded 20 millimeter cannon would blow her apart like a dog food balloon. She'd seen it in the war. A single round could pass through Danny, the Mustang's engine block, and the rest of the vehicle, yet still have enough power left to punch a two-foot pothole in the road. She was already throwing herself into the Mustang when the big gun opened up and the world around her turned to hell. She'd kept the Mustang idling and the door open. The first burst from the 20 millimeter cannon went high. The supersonic crack of the rounds passing overhead at 3,400 feet per second had Danny instinctively bent double as she leaped behind the wheel. Her left foot was still on the ground when she slammed the old pony into reverse and slapped the accelerator to the floor. In a stinking cloud of tire smoke, she twisted the wheel around and the car reversed itself. The rear window and the windshield simultaneously exploded, and the driver's side door, which was still swinging open, let out a deafening bang as one of the 20-millimeter rounds whacked through it. The window glass turned to snow. Danny braced herself with her left hand on the windshield pillar to keep from being thrown out of the car as she bashed the shifter forward. The car got traction and jumped up the road. Danny was losing Amy and the Mustang to these sons of bitches. She yanked the steering wheel left and right, fishtailing the car even as it accelerated to break up the gunner's aim. The road ahead of her leaped into the glow of the headlights as if struck by a tornado, the heavy gun blowing the pavement apart. She pulled the wheel over and drove the Mustang off the road into the brush. It was never going to be the same car again, but this was no time to worry about the paint job. It had been eight seconds since the first burst of cannon fire, and Danny was still alive. She whipped the car through the rough desert brush, caught a zombie in the headlights, smashed it into the air over the hood, and now she had one headlamp, not two. She should douse the lights, she realized, but then they could see her taillights, and she wouldn't be able to see shit. She kept on driving and wondered why the cannon wasn't turning the entire desert into a blizzard of steel. There were zeros coming toward her through the bush. It had been fifteen seconds, and she was still alive. Then she heard the bark of a grenade launcher. The first burst of fire came down in a tight formation close in front of the Mustang, and the desert floor was blasted into the air, rocks and dirt and bushes at once. Danny drove, blinded by smoke and debris, into the explosions. The Mustang was choked by leaves and dust. The second salvo came down behind the car, except for the grenade that erupted beneath the rear axle. Everything turned upside down. The Mustang, the liquor, the first aid gear, the hoard of ammunition and weapons and food and whatever crap Danny thought she might possibly need on a road trip through the zombie-infested American landscape, gravity disappeared, then came back in the wrong direction. 
Danny was caught by the force of the blast and thrown against the steering wheel, then whiplashed back into the seat, and then she was flung at the ceiling because down was up. The Mustang slammed on its side into the dirt, upside down, and slid down an eight-foot drainage ditch until Danny could almost rest her head on the ground below. Red flames lit the world up. It was all red and black and yellow. Nothing else. Half deaf, half blind, and nearly senseless from the impact, Danny tucked her knees up under her and slid her feet through the empty frame of the driver's side door window. It couldn't have been more than three feet down to the bottom of the culvert she'd landed in, but she couldn't get free of the car. She needed to figure out why, because there were zombies and militiamen trying to kill her. A high, clear note rang in her ears, and there was pressure in her head, as if she was at the bottom of a swimming pool. Her thoughts were scrambled like old-fashioned television reception from the pre-digital days. What was keeping her dangling under the car? Somehow her arm had gotten hooked around her chest. Her left arm twisted around. Danny tried to reason the thing out. Something else exploded nearby, but she wasn't concerned about that. She attempted to get her arm free of the obstruction. No go. So she used her right hand to feel out what the problem might be, and now she understood. She had been holding the A pillar, the one that rose up from the hood to roof and held the windshield in. The door had been open then, banging on her knuckles. Now the door was firmly closed, jammed tight against the stony wall of the culvert, but her fingers were still wrapped around the A pillar. That posed an insoluble problem to Danny's fuddled mind. The Mustang had become like a great big rat trap, and Danny was trapped in it. She smelled gasoline. She loved the smell of gasoline on a man, but not the smell of gasoline running out of the Mustang, especially as the car was on fire. The threat of fire combined with the stink of gas cleared Danny's head enough so she could panic. Things couldn't get much worse. She needed to pry the door open and release her crushed fingers, which she expected was going to hurt like a motherfucker. Otherwise, she was going to be burned alive, which was the thing she feared most. So Danny groped around her for something to get the door open with. There were tools on her belt, nothing that would fit in the gap of the door, unless the barrel of her revolver. She pulled the weapon from the holster. Pain was beginning to converge on her shoulder where her weight hung awkwardly on the trapped arm. She strained to get one knee on the window frame of the door and the other foot on the ground. Now she had a little leverage. She got the barrel of the gun into the rumpled gap between door and roof. She pried at it with all her weight. The gun was coming apart. She was bending the frame around the cylinder. The door shifted slightly. She could flex her fingers. Then the Mustang settled another half inch, and Danny saw the gap tighten on her hand. The skin of her left index finger split open like a frying sausage. She needed to make a plan come together fast, or she was definitely going to die. Danny tried prying the door open again. Now the barrel of the gun wouldn't even fit into the gap. The space was half the width of her fingers. She heard herself whimpering and made it stop. Now she could hear the moaning out in the darkness. Danny lowered her head down below the roof of the Mustang so she could see along the length of the culvert, lit by burning creosote bushes and fragrant mesquite. Two zeros were lurching in her direction, bent silhouettes in the leaping firelight. She couldn't come up with a plan. By fire or teeth, she was going to die in the wreckage of her beloved 1968 Mustang unless she got herself clear of the vehicle, and her left hand was jammed into a sandwich of steel less than three-eighths of an inch wide. Danny knew what she needed to do. All the bright hope inside her was still there, but she couldn't use it for anything. Some day everybody had to die, and this was her day. She raised the revolver to her temple and didn't think any grand last thoughts or send a prayer up to God or even say goodbye to Kelly's memory. It was easier than that. She squeezed the trigger to send the fat bullet through her head to blot out the stink of gasoline and the flames and the biting jaws that were coming for her. The gun didn't fire. She distorted the frame so much the hammer wouldn't fall. Danny fumbled at her belt and found the knife she'd gotten in San Francisco. That was something. She could cut her throat. Or, Danny's pain-clouded mind saw a possibility. 
It was as bad an idea as she'd ever had, but it was better than cutting her throat. Danny took the nickel-plated handcuffs from her belt, let the jaws fall open, and snapped them onto her left wrist, one bracelet at a time. The pain in her trapped fingers was unbelievable, filling the world. She cinched the cuffs tight. They ratcheted down until the bracelet sank into the skin of her arm. Still, she squeezed them, until the flesh wouldn't compress anymore, and she was working against the density of her own wrist bones. That would have to do. She could feel the pulse hammering in her arm against this obstacle, these constricting bands of steel. Good. Danny reached down with her good hand and drew out the knife. The nearest zombie was twenty yards away at most. There were several more behind it, lurching down the ditch toward the fire. The smoke from burning tires and gasoline was choking her. It didn't seem as if the gas tank was going to explode. It was going to burn itself out, which could take all night roasting her, but meanwhile flaming gasoline was streaming down the rear frame of the car, spattering in bright flaring droplets into the boiling pool of motor oil collected near Danny's foot. The heat was intense. There was a rhythmic thumping in her ears, like a helicopter passing overhead. It was her own heartbeat. Danny raised the blade of the knife, a good sharp edge four inches long with a few serrations down by the hilt. It was a tight space, but she was able to get the blade in close to where her fingers were crushed against the frame of the Mustang. She held her breath, thrust the knife into the gap. Blood spilled out despite the handcuffs, and a wire of white-hot agony snapped across Danny's brain. She dropped the knife. It bounced to the ground and skittered away under the roof of the car. Danny couldn't reach it. Her heart contracted to a pinpoint. She had nothing left to free herself from the coffin the Mustang had become. Teeth. Danny grasped her handcuffed wrist and stretched the flesh back as far as she could. She maneuvered her jaws until her teeth were jammed against the frame of the Mustang. Her knuckle, salty with blood, was between her lips. Danny thrust her head forward and bit down. The pain was so much bigger than her hand crushed into its outline with punishing force. She jammed her teeth into her flesh with strength renewed by fear, and the skin broke. Blood flowed. There was meat under there, rubbery cables, then the hard joint. She worked her teeth between the two bones that made up her knuckle. They fit together so closely. There was a pop when she forced them apart. She chewed until she was choking in her own blood, the pain making her writhe. At last, the finger snapped away from her hand. The zombies were so close, moaning with hunger, but they hadn't reached her yet. Danny got through three of her fingers before she was released from the Mustang. She fell to the dirt floor of the ditch and tucked her mutilated limb up against her chest. The sole of her boot was on fire. She crawled away from the blazing motor oil and hunched herself along, but the zeros were there. So after all that, she was going to get torn apart anyway. She struggled to her feet. The boot, at least, wasn't burning anymore. There was a transcendental giddiness in her now, all the pain and terror like vast electrified wings that could bear her away. The zero was there. It reached out to her, almost in welcome, its mouth open, teeth exposed. She could see the firelight reflecting off the back of its mottled throat. And then its head blew clean off its shoulders. A comical little spurt of black blood popped up from the ragged meat of its neck, and the thing collapsed. Then a great dark shape leaped down from the upper world above the culvert, a shaggy, ugly thing with a wild, broken face. Danny did the only thing left. She blacked out. Part 4. Heaven. 1. Amy got her butt kicked. There was no question about that. It was almost worth it, the way Danny hightailed it like a jackrabbit back to that beautiful old stupid Mustang of hers. Danny did a fancy dive into the car, and it was moving before she was even all the way in. Then the guy with the face tattoos was shooting at Danny with his huge tank gun, buck, 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 buck. Danny got the car spun all the way around back to front and hit the gas. Amy could hear people shouting inside the motor home. Then Reese was pounding Amy silly, and she couldn't really look anymore because she was taking a severe beating. Reese stopped hitting her in order to watch the shooting. 
Murdo was screaming in a high-pitched voice and jumping up and down, waving his fists. The flame from the huge cannon leaped ten feet from the barrel. The lights of the Mustang turned from crisp outlines into dim glows as the landscape blew up around it. Amy could hear metallic hammering noises and assumed that Danny was getting blown to pieces. Amy was so used to Danny turning back up again, from that motorcycle accident when she was young, then from the war and the war again and another war, and now coming back from her mission in the world of the undead, that she didn't experience shock or grief, but disbelief. This couldn't be it. Danny couldn't finally be gone. Then it looked as if Amy's faith was vindicated. Danny took the Mustang off-road, so much dust kicked up you couldn't even see where it was. It was like a smokescreen, and the gun was shooting up all over the place, but they could still hear the Mustang's engine roaring away out there like a wounded bear. Danny was so smart, especially if everything was going wrong. She wasn't so good in a non-crisis, but this was right up her alley. The shooting stopped. Were they going to let Danny go? Please let it stop, Amy thought. You have no idea what she's been through. Then there was a ching-thud, ching-thud sound, two bursts of ten repetitions each, and a long moment later, the desert blew up. They were shooting bombs at Danny. There was an explosion, and Amy saw the shape of the Mustang flip end over end, silhouetted against the halo of fire, and then it dropped into the flames and smoke and dirt, and that was that. Reese kicked Amy one more time, spat on her, and walked away, whooping with triumph. Murdo himself was hollering victory, clapping. Boudreau stood there watching the fires out in the desert, framed squarely in the gateway to the airfield. His posture was one of satisfaction, like a weary man admiring the snug house he had just finished building. Amy felt real hatred for these men. Hate and rage weren't things she understood, but they had roosted inside her, and she was going to have to deal with them. They wanted her to hurt and kill, to get revenge. That's all the world had in it. Amy rejected these things, but the feeling, the black rage burned on, like the fires in the desert that marked Danny's grave. Murdo clapped Boudreau on the shoulder as he walked toward the ASV. Boudreau rocked his fist in the air. They were yelling many things to each other. Apparently, they were the winners. Then Boudreau's ear blew off, and he lurched backward and fell to the ground, dead, his skull emptied out by a high-velocity round. A second later, they heard the gunshot. Murdo threw himself into the dirt, covered in blood and brains, and crawled under the ASV. Two more shots snapped through the night, but nobody else was hit. Reese sprinted inside the terminal building. The gates were still wide open, and now above the whoosh and crackle of the flames out in the desert, they could hear them moaning. Undead were coming. Zeros. Amy didn't feel as good as she usually did. She had never been physically beaten before, beyond the occasional parental spanking. It wasn't the pain so much as the fear it wouldn't stop. Reese had clearly gone easy on her. He couldn't incapacitate the medic, veterinarian or not. He was only trying to slow her down, which had the opposite effect, of course. If he couldn't afford to kill her, she could afford to give him the bird. Still, she was very sore. She felt a fresh wave of empathy for Patrick and didn't blame him for having a nice, quiet coma. Amy got creaking to her feet and hobbled across the parking lot. She could hear Murdo down low, arguing with the men huddled inside the ASV as she limped past. She could hear agitated voices inside the white whale. She skirted around Boudreaux's corpse to the gates and swung them shut, one at a time. She closed the padlock. One thing she wasn't concerned with was getting shot by whoever was out there in the night. She had a feeling it was somebody she knew. She could see the zeros coming now, some as rough outlines crossing in front of the firelight, some moving into the glow of the headlights on the vehicles. They were slow and shuffling and slack-jawed, that sound like the wind in winter trees coming out of their throats. The undead were finally here, and it seemed to Amy there were an awful lot of them. Dawn took its time coming. The Hawkstone men were no longer in control. They used the civilians as a human shield to extricate themselves from their vehicles. That was Molini's idea. 
He suspected whoever shot Boudreau must be one of the men they'd ejected from the airfield days before. Gun in hand, he formed up a weeping ring of survivors and sent them scuffling across the parking lot with himself in the middle. They pulled up next to each of the military vehicles until all his comrades had been able to climb out and crouch behind the circle of human cover. They didn't know from what direction the gunshots came, although it seemed likely to be along the road. Not worth taking chances. They forced the huddle of civilians back into the terminal and then made them close all the roller blinds on the windows while the mercenaries remained firmly on the floor, shoving their guns around. Becky, with the fake boobs, had the baby in her arms again. She pulled down a roller blind in the men's dormitory. Flamingo was pressed against the wall with his gun aimed at her head. Patrick lay still between them. Goddamn coward, she said. Fuck you, whore, Flamingo said. This baby's mother had more balls than you. She strode past him, ignoring the gun. Two. The sky grew light that morning in a silvery overcast, the bank of clouds that had been on the horizon the previous day having moved in over the desert. It was hot and still. The overcast did nothing to cut the heat of the sun. All it did was dim the colors of the world, making the undead, with their leathery gray skin and ragged, dingy clothes, look even more monochromatic. The trip through the desert had dried them out. Lips were pulled away from long teeth, eyes shrunken, bone structure telegraphing through the thin flesh. The fat ones in life had become as dry-skinned as all the rest, but the fat formed liquefying sacks around their waists, their thighs, and the upper parts of their arms. These dangled and swung like the infected udders of cows, leaking serum. The weight of this putrefying flesh dragged the loose skin in folds from their necks, their heads, giving them something of the look of droop-eyed hounds, their mouths pulled down in a caricature of a frown. The ones that had been slender in life were now angular stick insects, skeletons bound in hide, moving with difficulty as their tendons shrank and stiffened. Around 6.30, once the light was full, a bulky figure in the hawkstone camouflage stepped out of the terminal. He looked around, his body poised for flight. Then he walked toward the corpse of Boudreaux, unwilling, his steps as halting as if he were crossing a minefield. He made it to the body. The moaning of the undead went up loud and urgent. They could smell him. They wanted him. The chain link of the fence and gates bellied outward with the mass of the things. They wrung the wire with their fingers, clawing to get in. The man took hold of the corpse's sleeve and started pulling it across the parking lot. The corpse was heavy, heavier than the man dragging it toward the terminal building. He stopped halfway across to wipe the sweat off his face with his sleeve, taking the opportunity to scan his surroundings. Then he turned back to the task. He got the body another yard toward the terminal before a spray of blood leaped out of his chest and he fell across the corpse, his boots clawing at the pavement until he bled to death and went limp. The report of the rifle followed the impact by almost a second. Inside the terminal, Murdo cursed and punched the wall, leaving a row of dimples where his knuckles hit the plasterboard. For a while, it looked like Juan, the fat Mexican, was going to make it. They had dressed him up in Jones's uniform, which didn't fit him very well, but looked convincing enough from the kind of distance a sniper would be dealing with. Then they forced the blubbering, shiny-faced man out the door at gunpoint. He could go out there where it was a 50-50 chance he'd get shot, or he could stay in here where the chance was 100%. All the way to Boudreaux's body, Juan looked like he was still deciding which option suited him best. Then he seemed to gather courage. He was still alive, after all. Murdo thought the solid mass of zombies might be spoiling the shot for whoever was out there. It might have been true. But the sniper found a better angle, apparently, because he blew Juan's heart clean out of his body. Now the Zeros were going crazy, their hunger driving them against the fence, as if they could push themselves clear through it if they tried hard enough. Murdo's main concern was that they probably could. 
There were hundreds of them, with more on the way, and the fence rocked slightly as they thrust themselves upon it. Meanwhile, inside the terminal, the civilian hostages wept and cursed. 3. Wolf got another one with a trick shot. He'd spent the morning of the third day after he rescued the sheriff, getting himself into the high ground overlooking the airfield, and he was working his way along the ridge. These hawkstone dipshits couldn't simultaneously search for his position and hide on the floor, so they had no idea where to find him, and they obviously didn't put on their thinking caps either. Because right now, there were very few safe places he could shoot from without getting eaten alive. One of them was the stony ridge that ran parallel with the runway. He had a good 600 feet of altitude at a fairly steep angle. From that height, he could see down into the rooms of the terminal building if the windows were clear. They had the place buttoned up pretty well now. All the blinds were drawn. But the blinds stood off the interior window frames a couple of inches. He noticed, in one of the upstairs sleeping rooms the men used, every now and then somebody would move the edge of the roller shade a little and have a quick look around. And when they did, Wolf could clearly see the silhouette of legs, a glimpse of them, between window frame and blind, invisible from below, obvious from above. Now, Wolf didn't want to kill any non-combatants. He wasn't sure about the fat guy he'd shot, for example. He wasn't built like a fighter, and his uniform looked borrowed. So that might mean they were dressing up civilians and sending them out to die. Far from troubling Wolf, this merely added to the interest of the assignment. The possibility of an unforgivable error made the stakes higher, sweetened the pot. Still, he had to make damn sure it wasn't a harmless woman, especially the one with the ten-gallon hats in her shirt. He thought he might have a chance with her, if he cleaned up a little. He elevated the barrel of the rifle, adjusted for windage and gravity. The legs were there behind the window blind, and then the weight shifted and the curtain fell back into its usual position. They were about to move on. Wolf fired, brought the target back into the scope, and waited. There was no sign of whether he'd gotten a clean hit or not. There was a tiny black dot where the bullet had gone through the blind, half an inch from the window frame, a little haze around it. That would be the broken glass. Nothing else. Wolf crawled backward on his belly until he was out of view. He didn't want to risk their locating him. That grenade launcher could turn the ridgeline into Mount Rushmore. He scrambled along a deep ledge until he found the notch that took him right over the other side of the ridge. It was getting harder and harder to travel, what with all the zombies down there. Looked like a wildebeest herd, but it was all walking corpses. Some of them were struggling along trails that a mountain goat would have trouble with. Wolf had seen a couple fall, tumbling down the mountainside to land broken in the rocks. One of them even kept on crawling. They weren't afraid of anything, that was clear. Wolf was only afraid of them, nothing else, except maybe that Sheriff Adelman, so he figured that was about as good as it was going to get. All he had to do was stay up high and not fall off anything and break his back. The irony alone would kill him, and then he might get up dead and start looking for fresh meat. Nothing else happened that day. Wolf was a man of infinite patience. He waited. Dawn came. Morning turned to day. Then the front door of the terminal building opened, and Wolf sighted on the figure below through the scope of his rifle. The man was wearing the hawkstone camouflage. The hunt was back on. 4. Danny opened her eyes. The sun was shining. The sky was blue. In the dream, she had been swimming. The water was warm and full of bright, flashing fish. She dove down among the rocks and coral. There was no question of drowning. She could hold her breath forever. She swam down through a gap in the rocks where the light was green and dim. Then she swam through a dark tunnel, ribbed and barreled like the inside of a cartoon whale. She swam upward toward the light, broke the surface, and found herself in a bathtub. It was in an all-white bathroom with a bedroom beyond. A fire burned in the fireplace. Then she woke up. You look like Patrick, she murmured. 
I am Patrick, the man replied. This surprised Danny. The Patrick she remembered was on the pretty side of handsome. This man was not. His face was a symphony of yellows and browns, with notes of deep blue like the USDA ink stains on a side of beef. His nose was very different from Patrick's as well, all dented in, and one of his eyes was a raw red slit between thick lids. Only his hair looked the same. Hi, Danny said and laughed a little. Laughing was physically painful, but it felt good anyway. It sounded like rocks grinding together. Of events at Boscombe Field, Danny had no recollection at all. She dimly remembered driving down the road, but nothing more. Take it easy, Patrick said. We got you stuffed with all kinds of painkillers. Might make you kind of lightheaded. Who's we? Danny asked. She was floating in a haze, unable to connect even the most rudimentary pieces of information with each other. The sun was behind Patrick's head, turning his blonde hair into a golden halo. He was wearing a white T-shirt. It occurred to Danny that she might be dead, and this was heaven. Then she was disappointed to remember what she had been avoiding the memory of since she awoke. The world was overrun by walking dead that ate human flesh, so probably this wasn't heaven. She was glad she hadn't mentioned it to Patrick. Patrick counted off on his fingers. Topper and Ernie, Martin, Simon, Don, Troy's here. Even Wolf comes by every once in a while for food and water. He's not such a bad guy. He stayed right beside you the whole first night you were here. Went away before the sun came up. As much as she enjoyed lying on her back being stoned, Danny felt like there was a great deal of data she was missing, and her hypothesis was woefully out of date. She tried to push herself up into a sitting position, but Patrick gently glided her back. Let me get you a pillow, he said, and hoisted himself up. Patrick was walking with the help of a stick, Danny observed. He was obviously in pain, but didn't make much of it. That was different. He used to complain about damn near everything. Now he had something real to bitch about. He was bearing it with grace. Danny drifted out of consciousness without knowing it. When she woke again, Topper was kneeling beside her. He had a fading black eye himself, though not quite as bad as Patrick's. Patrick returned. He arranged a balled-up overcoat under Danny's head. She was lying on, or very close to, the ground, inside something like a big turtle shell, that much detective work she could handle. Topper knelt beside her, and she smelled armpits and whiskey and motor oil. The motor oil smell disturbed her for a reason Danny could not summon before her mind. How you feeling, Sheriff? Feeling no pain, Danny said and smiled back. There's so much dope in your bloodstream, we could probably sell your piss for fifty bucks a shot, Topper said. Danny wanted to laugh again, but it seemed like a lot of effort, so she passed out instead. They cleared the farmhouse room by room, two men inside, both dead. They were not locals. Danny thought they were from the city, not the middle of nowhere where they had been patrolling flat sand to keep the date palms safe. The woman in black was dead, someone said. Danny went outside again. She hadn't spared a thought for the woman since she'd run for the side of the farmhouse to get herself out of range of the windows. Now Danny went out into the broiling hot yard and crossed the dirt to the place where the woman lay, dead, her eyes half open and staring at a point somewhere beyond the center of the sky. Her lips were parted. Danny saw hard white teeth with dark patina between them. The satchel mine the woman had been holding was kicked several meters away from the body, Danny would secure it in a few seconds. First, she leaned close to the dead woman, wanting to ask her, What were you doing? Why did he kill you? Who did you imagine I was? But the woman's eyes opened, and they were not eyes at all. They were mouths full of crooked teeth. Danny returned to awareness at intervals throughout the remainder of the day and night. Unconsciousness, within which there was nothing, eventually gave way to sleep, where there were picture plays of the waking world. At last, Danny was able to remain awake for as much as an hour at a time. Along with returning clarity of mind came the return of pain, 
to which she responded by demanding the others stop feeding her with tranquilizers. Her body needed a complete overhaul, and at some point the many things she had decided not to think about emerged and demanded to be known. To distract herself, she studied her surroundings. She was lying on an old mattress inside the stripped frame of an ancient automobile. There was no floor, it was only the hull. The roof formed a sunshade. There was no glass to keep in the heat of the day, and without the doors she could see a section of the scenery on either side. Piles of crushed and broken automobiles towered all around, flattened as if by their combined weight. There were heaps of chrome parts, old fenders, and grills. Iron racks bore windshields and door glass, arranged by make and model. Dumpsters full of alternators, engine blocks, motors, transmissions, and all the rest of the guts of cars stood in ranks below the walls of mashed vehicles. The place had been paved with concrete once, but the concrete had split and broken, and now it was pavement, dirt, and lank brown grass in equal measures. Topper explained to Danny during one of her brief lucid periods that they were in heaven. It was a wrecking yard, not three miles from Boscombe Field. He and Ernie had seen it on the day they arrived at the airfield. They made straight for the place when they were banished by the mercenaries. Danny asked about that, and Topper told her it was a long story for when she was fully awake. They had a big old Chinese-made diesel generator, welding gear, a machine shop, and all the raw materials a man could ever ask for, if he was man enough to ask for raw materials. They even had a fridge full of beer. They were surrounded by a fortress of crushed cars and a tall sheet metal fence. They had some projects going. We're going to put some gear together and retake that motherfucking airfield for one thing, Topper said. We're going to make ourselves some battle wagons. He was excited now, his voice raised almost to a shout. Patrick came back and shooed him away. Danny awoke in the night. There was a lump of moon in the sky and bunches of stars. She could see a couple of the planets, although, as always, she had no idea which ones they were. Patrick was sleeping beside her inside the shell of the old car. They were lying under a heap of second-hand clothing. It was cool, but not cold. Danny's left hand itched like fury. It was driving her mad, woke her up. It felt as if ants were inside the bones, making tunnels. She couldn't get her fingers to move. So Danny extracted her hand from beneath the pile of clothes and discovered it was bound inside a large wad of cotton gauze. She unhooked the butterfly clips that held the gauze in place, unwinding the long strips of bandage until her hand was exposed. It was too dark to see. Even the pale gauze was little more than a blue-gray smudge in the shadows. Her hand was an astringent-smelling darkness in the greater darkness of the night. So she felt her way up from the wrist with the other hand. The wrist was badly sprained, swollen and tender. Her palm was rough with abrasions. There was a crust, presumably blood, in all the creases of her hand. Then her fingers slipped up past her knuckles, and there was nothing. She closed her good hand over the injured one. Before she could understand what she was feeling, a massive fireball of pain leaped up her arm and blew her straight back into oblivion. You chewed off your fingers, Patrick explained. That's what Wolf thinks. He found something in your mouth, apparently. Patrick shivered involuntarily. Danny was trying to remember, squinting up into a pale gray sky, pink at the margins. Dawn was an hour away. She had bled a lot in the night. Patrick had awakened in the wee hours to find both of them sticky with blood. Despite his protestations, Danny had a close look at the damage by flashlight before the fresh gauze went on. She had a thumb and a pinky finger, then three swollen knuckles with the skin sutured at the ends like sausage casing. The fingers were gone, and there was blackening, ragged skin around the cinched-up wounds. Do you remember what happened? he continued. If one of those undead things did this, you could have some kind of infection... He trailed off, leaving it unspoken. They could both guess what would happen. I don't remember anything after seeing the airfield down the road. There was somebody there. That's it. 
How long ago was that? Two days, Patrick said, as if admitting something shameful. Two fucking days? Danny wanted to sit up again. Patrick held her down with both hands. She lacked the strength to resist and fell asleep again. When Danny awoke, the sun was close to rising. She kept her eyes shut and started thinking about her new situation. She felt she was at some kind of crossroads. She knew guys, people in rehab, soldiers and marines dealing all the time with the Veterans Administration, who were missing a hand or both hands or a foot or a couple of legs. Eyes, faces, what have you, missing. They spent so much of their time trying to increase the amount they were considered legally disabled. This was the percentage. 20% got you a certain stipend every month. 30, 50, 80% disabled. They were all worth increasing sums. At 100%, you could practically live on the money the government allowed you. Except, of course, you spent it all on the iron lung and diapers. Danny couldn't get a thin dime once she could walk again, because she had been deemed fully recovered. The VA didn't give a shit if you were ugly and deformed, as long as you could theoretically go out and get a job cleaning bedpans. But now she was properly disabled. She was sporting half the stock number of hands. She had phantom limb syndrome and everything. Her non-existent fingers continued to itch. She could probably get a handicap tag for the Mustang. A tremor of doubt rattled through her mind. The Mustang. There was some question about the car, but she couldn't remember what it was. The reverie fell apart. Danny wasn't fooling herself. She knew that even if there still was a Veterans Administration, she thought of Harlan again, presumably rotting away in a bed untended. Even if parking was ever an issue again, she wasn't somebody who could call herself handicapped. She was going to have to put this thing behind her. She was going to have to figure out a system for living the same way she was before, only one-handed. Which shouldn't be difficult, the voice said. It never slept. You weren't living very well before. She had lost a part of herself and come out alive. She was stronger than ever, because she had even less to lose. She knew it was the painkillers, but Danny was exhilarated by this weird new situation. She had to share the moment with somebody. She didn't feel loss, as she expected to do. She didn't resent having to chew off her own fingers. Rather, she felt impossibly alive. She felt irreducible. What she was had been reduced to its absolute essence, then reduced again, and then she was supposed to die. But she didn't die. So everything ahead of her was extra time. Danny rolled over on her good elbow and shook Patrick. Hey she said in an urgent whisper. What is it? Patrick whispered back. I'm invincible. She passed out again. By midday, she had a raging fever. Patrick kept asking for cool cloths to wipe Danny down, and the others kept bringing him filthy shop rags. Danny's face was getting progressively dirtier as the fever expanded, but if Patrick left her alone for ten minutes, her sweat flushed most of the grime off. He'd given her some oral antibiotics they'd found, but of course, knowing nothing about antibiotics, Patrick might be treating her for malaria for all he knew. Whatever the stuff was, it didn't seem to be helping. Am I in love with this weather-beaten woman? Patrick wondered as he tried again to rouse Danny enough to drink something. Stranger things had happened, were happening all over the world. No, he decided. He loved her which wasn't the same thing. But it was still a big deal. Danny was talking again. The fever brought up whatever was stewing in her subconscious, like dragging the bottom of a swamp with an oar. She murmured a great deal of gibberish and sometimes spoke of her sister Kelly, never to her. She spoke directly to Patrick when she recognized him, to the Amy in her mind's eye at other times. She spoke to someone named Zero Killer, and even once to Weaver, begging him to get down. But Kelly was in the past now. Patrick kept her cool as he could and frequently changed the looted thrift store shirts tucked beneath her to serve as diapers. It remained a miracle to Patrick how often women could pee. Danny was starting to stink, Patrick realized, not like body odor or the sickbed, but a rotten smell, like death. 
Danny's stump of hand had swelled to three times its original diameter. There was no question. That was where the stink was coming from. The wounds, which Patrick had sewn shut himself as he'd seen Amy do, were weeping and purple where the stitches dug in, but turning gray at the edges. He was losing her. After all that Danny had been through, after all the enemies she had faced, it was the microscopic army that was going to beat her. Hey, Topper, heat me up a sharp piece of wire, Patrick said, like red hot. Topper took one look at Danny's hand, said, Oh, Jesus, fuck, and walked away, shaking his head. It don't have fucking stink, Ernie said, handing the sterilized wire to Patrick at arm's length. Patrick examined the bulb of Danny's hand, swollen now to the size of her folded knee, purple and hot to the touch. He was wasting time. Go for it. There was a moon-shaped hubcap in his lap, upturned like a salad bowl. He held Danny's limp arm over the basin formed by the hubcap. Then, with a sharp inhalation, he thrust the sharpened wire into the palm of Danny's hand. It popped. An incredible quantity of stinking, bloody pus spurted out, marbled with whirls of amber and greenish cream. It spattered his second-hand jeans, then the stream lost pressure and steadied. The stench made him want very much to throw up. He swallowed and kept swallowing, but he couldn't help crying out. He said, oh God, oh my God, over and over. The liquid continued to run out until it was dribbling. Much as he would rather have been stabbed to death with chopsticks, Patrick changed his grip on the purulent wound and started milking the puffy flesh. Gobs of congealed pus belched out of the puncture, things that looked like chewed fat. Finally, the wound ran blood. Patrick let it bleed for a minute, then doused the whole red mess in alcohol and wrapped it back up with fresh white bandage. The hubcap in his lap was almost full. The hot liquid sloshed over his thumb as Patrick carried it away and poured it down a storm drain in the pavement. Then he vomited down the drain and stayed like that with his head dangling and his hands on his knees for several minutes. Topper came by and slapped him on the back. You done a hell of a thing. Topper said. Fucking Florence fucking Nightingale, man. After all that, she better not die, Patrick said, and heaved again. Danny didn't die. It had been four days since she bit herself free of the Mustang. She was feeling much better. Damn good, even. The fever broke, the black clouds that raged and stormed inside her mind cleared away, and despite the gleaming pain, she began to ask questions in earnest. That was the men's best proof that she was going to survive. She wanted to know what the plan was. The men had come to this place only an hour or two after they were banished. The junkyard was located behind a butte of rock at the base of the mountains, separated from the airfield by a foothill upon which the airfield was backed. If you scaled the butte, which was not difficult because the stacked cars made an effective stairway up its flank, there was a flat place from which you could see the airfield with binoculars, or better yet, the Celestria 8-inch telescope they'd set up for that purpose. As Topper enthusiastically explained, because the bulk of the plan was his, they were currently beefing up a 9C1 Chevy Impala, the police car they'd found abandoned down the road. Danny remembered it. There had been an old, wizened zombie in the back. She looked like fucking King Tut, but she was still kicking, Topper chuckled. I made Ernie do the braining on that one. They had made some modifications to the basic police package that Topper thought Danny would like. In addition, they had an old Ford pickup running, not to mention Patrick's fire truck, and there were a couple of adequate Harleys that didn't need much work to be roadworthy. The plan was to creep up on the airfield at night, lights off, then all of a sudden ram the fence from the side behind the terminal building, not at the gates where the grenade launcher and the 20 millimeter cannon presented an obstacle, let alone about 400 zombies. The rest of them would get in there through the gap and start killing anybody over six foot. Along with her health, Danny's memory had returned. Not all of it, but she could now remember the early part of the confrontation she'd had with the Hawkstone men, 
and that the Mustang had gone to pony heaven. Their leader is 5'9 at the most, Danny said, remembering Murdo. She heard the plan out. It was suicidal, violent, and likely to result in civilian casualties, failure, and death in that order. But it was a hell of a plan, nonetheless. Something bothered Danny, though. They were leaving when I got there. Where were they going, did they say? Danny asked. Their command was supposed to be in Potter, Patrick volunteered. Danny tossed her good hand in the air. It isn't. Do they know that? Patrick shrugged. They don't know anything. Potter is a death trap, Danny barked. Something was bothering her, some fact that didn't fit the picture. Wait a minute, she eventually said. It's four days later. How come they're still at the airfield? Topper took off his greasy Kenworth gimme cap and scratched the thin, scraggly hair underneath. That's where old Wolfie come in, Topper said. He looked uneasy. He clearly knew Danny might not approve of this part of the plan, but he bravely continued. See, Wolfman lit out right before those fuckwads showed up, right? He just disappeared the way he does, and he was like living on jackrabbits in the brush because there weren't that many zombies around at the time. Watching the airfield, never more than 500 yards away, and them twats didn't even know he was there. And he had his rifle, too. So when we got tossed out on our asses, he followed us here, and we met up and told him the deal, and I already had this idea going, right? And he said he'd keep him there long as he could until we had ourselves set up. You guys, Danny said, shaking her head. So days are going by, right? Topper was warming to his narrative. Wolf is down there watching, and he comes and briefs us on the intel from the field. He hears shouting sometimes. Then a few mornings back, he hears a gunshot, and that black chick with the little baby gets carried out dead. Those cocksuckers left her on the ground and ran. Once it was dark, Wolf buried her with rocks. By that time, the zombies were showing up by the dozen, so he had to retreat to high ground. But that rifle of yours got a real good fucking scope on it. Wolf could see just fine. He sees they're pulling out, so he comes back here and tells us about it, and I says to him, shit, we're not ready. So he says he figures he can slow them down. Slow them down, Danny said, and Topper heard the disapproval again, but he pressed on. Well, see, that's where you come in. We were going to put our plan in action when all of a sudden the long-lost Sheriff Adelman pulls up to the airfield in a fine example of vintage American iron. Then those pricks blew you off the map. We're all real sorry about the staying, incidentally. Wolf was right there. He saw it all happen not 200 yards away. 300, Ernie added. 300, Topper amended. You fucked up my story, Ernie. Sorry, Topper. Mind if I continue? Please. So Wolf is right there, under a quarter mile away, Topper went on. Danny enjoyed simply hearing their voices, being among people she knew. They shared something. They survived together. He took a chance and crawled to your position, Topper said. Fucking zombies were right there on you, practically. You're hung up under the car, then you're doing something, and before he gets to you, you're free. He thought you were a zombie for a minute on account of what you'd done. Them cuffs was a good idea. He said your hand didn't bleed hardly at all. The wolfman took out the zombies and carried you off a safe ways. Calls us to come quick, no lights. How are you communicating this whole time? Danny asked. Ernie produced a toy plastic walkie-talkie in a magenta case with stickers of a cartoon girl all over it. We got these at the store, Ernie said. Toy department. You couldn't talk from one end of the trailer to the other with them goddamn toy radios we had when I was a kid, but these new ones got a good range on them. But the range ain't so good you can hear the whole way, so we done relays with them. That was Ernie's idea, Topper said. He ain't as stupid as he smells. We set up a daisy chain with the radios. Wolf talks on the first one. We got a man halfway back, gets Wolf's message, and he talks on the next one to send the message to our lookout up top. Topper gestured to the butte, where Martin, the skinny college kid, was crouching above them. Go keep watch, for Christ's sakes, Topper shouted, catching sight of Martin. Martin walked away out of view across the top of the butte. Man, we're as bad as those pukes down at the airfield, Topper added, then went on. 
Tell you the truth, Wolf was real mad about what happened to you. He shot one of those fuckers in the head right after he found you, just out of spite. And that give us all the idea to keep him where we want him. Anytime one of them pecker wipes shows himself, we shoot him. Shit, they keep peeking out the windows. They might run out of men before we're even ready to move on the plan. Having heard the whole story, what Danny meant to say was, what an extraordinary series of actions. What an unprecedented situation. It is thought-provoking. I am impressed, and I am compelled. What she said was, fuck. And again, thoughtfully, fuck. They knew what she meant. Danny ate for the first time in days and ate well. Macaroni and cheese from a box, followed by cocktail franks from a jar. Then she felt sick, but it stayed down, and the next thing was thirst. She wanted beer, something cheap and American if they had it, but no light beer. Patrick brought her three large bottles of sparkling water. She complained, then drank all three bottles inside 40 minutes. A while later, she belched with such force that Ernie came to see what the noise was, a welding mask propped up on his forehead. Nice one, Sheriff, he said, and went back through the piles of wrecked cars to report the occasion to Topper. Danny was back under the old car hull. It was a 1939 Buick, she had determined. Patrick was on radio relay duty at the listening post out in the desert, a spot relatively zombie safe because it had an eight-foot cliff on one side and an old cow pen with heavy wire along the other. Still, an anxiety-producing place to be, easily surrounded. Topper came by to visit Danny. He was reeking of ozone from the arc welder in the shed. They were going to move her to the living quarters next, but they wanted her to be able to walk on her own. She thought she probably could. The men were shacked up inside a corrugated iron Quonset hut around the corner, where the interior parts and upholstery were kept by the previous owners. The men were sleeping on bench seats scavenged from old trucks. It was a bachelor's paradise, except for the absence of good-looking ladies. Pardon the implication, Topper added. I don't know how you survive all this, Topper mused. It's got me stumped, too, Danny said, and waited. When Topper didn't laugh, she prodded him with her good elbow. That's just wrong, Topper said. Danny cawed with laughter. It wasn't a pretty laugh. It sounded like somebody sawing a sheet of tin, in fact. But then again, she wasn't accustomed to laughing. Danny wanted very much to get into action. Her friends were down there. She couldn't remember what directly preceded her getting blown up and performing the self-amputation, but she knew Amy was in trouble. Danny remembered that she had seen her friend alive, but not what she saw. There were the stories of what had happened before as well. The mercenaries from Hawkstone had beaten Patrick almost to death and killed the young mother. For all Danny knew, the baby was dead too. According to the reports from Wolf, three Hawkstone men were dead or wounded, although one of them might have been somebody else dressed as a soldier, he had to admit. Danny admired the old man's candor. He might have shot a non-combatant. His bad, he accepted full responsibility. He also knew there wasn't a working jail or courthouse on the West Coast. Later, Danny tried to figure out how to eat with one hand. There was no physical rehabilitation anymore. She would have to invent new ways of doing a lot of things. Patrick knelt beside her and produced a rumpled plastic bag from his back pocket. Inside was Kelly's note. You had it on you. Your uniform is cleaned up too, Patrick said. Danny was touched. Only he would have bothered. I heard they beat you up pretty good and left you down at the airfield, Danny said. How come you're here? Patrick drew invisible circles on the pavement with a piece of automotive trim. Those guys, those fake soldiers, Patrick said. Murdo, the boss, he hated me. I think he was latent. He chose me for his special enemy. They all kept fucking with me. It was so obvious they wanted to make an example out of me, and I was so like, no way, not happening, but even that upset them. I don't remember getting my ass kicked, thankfully, Patrick continued. I don't even remember the next, like, three or four days. They sat in silence for a while, 
Then Patrick made a couple of false starts at speaking. He wanted to say something, but couldn't find the right way to put it. Why did you go? He finally said. Danny shook her head. My sister, I was crazy to find her. I had to try. If it had been Weaver, you know what I mean? You went out to look for her. All the way to San Francisco. She's gone. It's all gone. I realized out there there's nothing left. Each other is all we got. It sounds gay, I know. I mean, I know what you mean. Anyways, I shouldn't have left you guys. I guess you didn't have a choice. Patrick didn't sound convinced, but Danny knew she didn't have the right to insist on understanding. What had happened to him, and to all of the survivors, was as much her responsibility as it was the mercenaries. Out of her emotional depth, she changed the subject. So what happened? I woke up the next day. I was marinating in my own pee, but I was all bandaged up, so I know Amy was taking care of me. What happened was I was staring at this god-awful spray-on acoustic ceiling material, and then one of them comes in, one of these hawkstone gangsters, the Italian one. He takes one look at me like I'm worthless, and then he peeks out the window. Half an hour later, he comes in and does it again. This time, the boss is with him, this guy named Murdo. He's such an overcompensator. Was he the short one? Total Porsche driver. He tells me I'm lucky I'm even alive, which is debatable based on the state my beautiful face is in. Then he tells me somebody is shooting at us, and he wants to know who. He thinks it was Topper. Of course, I hadn't the foggiest, and I told him that. He comes over to smack me some more, and just then Amy arrives and tells him if he hits me, I'll die. He says, so fucking what? I kid you not, his exact words, so fucking what? And right then, the window breaks. I thought the Italian stallion broke it, but he's going like this. Here, Patrick pantomimed, pressing his stomach with the heel of both hands. And he falls down. And I had no idea that much blood could come out of somebody. It was unbelievable. He got shot right then and there, just like Murdo said. Amy did whatever she was doing, tried to stop the bleeding, but she said it must have gone through his liver or something. He kept trying to fight her off. Then he died. So how many of them are left, as far as you know? Danny was caught up in the narrative, but she was also building up her calculations, adding in factors, trying to come up with a way to spring the others out of captivity that didn't involve making a big hole in the fence for zeros to get through. Patrick shrugged. Murdo, Parker, this guy with a neck like this, Reese and Flamingo, don't ask where he got his name. There's this psychopath called Ace, Amy told me he killed Cammie, the one with the baby. And there's Jones, this wounded one that Amy patched up. That's what started the whole thing. Danny hadn't heard the story of Jones yet. Patrick told her about it and everything else that had happened. It took much of the afternoon. By that time, most of the other men were fairly drunk and shouting obscenities, roaring with laughter as they carried parts back and forth and clanged around with hammers and built whatever it was they were building. Patrick was watching Danny's face. She didn't like the scrutiny. He seemed to be looking for something that ought to be there, but wasn't. I found the Mustang in Potter, Danny said, for the sake of breaking the silence. End of the trail. After that, Kelly was gone. Dead or alive, I don't know. It all seemed so long ago. Then you went to San Francisco, and did what? Nothing, Danny said, and meant it. The whole journey had been a waste of time. What happened wasn't worth recounting. I went for a swim in the ocean, Danny added, her voice freighted with guilt. You should have stayed, Patrick said, and contained within that small statement was the world of unintended consequences Danny had unleashed. He might forgive her some day, but she wouldn't. She felt a flood of grief and could have cried, but cleared her throat instead. So, how did you get out of Boscombe Field? Sounds like the place was locked down. Patrick could see Danny wasn't going to tell him anything else about her adventures, so he closed his eyes to summon the history before him. Yeah, and now with the Italian dead, the Hawkstone guys were really going cuckoo for their cocoa puffs, so to speak. Murdo went crazy. 
Not so much because he lost another man, I think, as because it could just as easily have been him that got hit. So next morning I can walk a little, and Murdo dresses me up in the flamingo's uniform. They all hide next to the windows with their guns, and Murdo tells me to go outside or they'll shoot me. I can totally see what the idea is, and everybody's yelling for me not to go out there because they did the same thing with Juan before and he's dead. But what do I care, right? I wanted to die at that point. So I went outside. If Wolf shot me, they were going to shoot back in the direction the shot came from. I guess he recognized me because nothing happened. Murdo was so mad he tried to shoot me from the front door, but Wolf shot the doorway up and all the big tough guys ended up on the floor. I went over to the hangar, got the fire truck out, and drove away. It's not that simple, Danny said. The airfield must be swarming with zombies. Everybody's dead by now, Amy, the rest. You didn't just open the gates full of zeros and shove through them and then close the gates behind you. I mean, you just didn't. You'd be dead. Oh, come on, Danielle, give other people a little credit. It's a truck full of fire-retardant foam. The gate has a big padlock with a key in it. All I had to do was drive over, unlock the padlock, and after a couple of minutes, I figured out how to work the foam gun. I sprayed my way out. Just like that. Well, yes, that stuff is awful. The zombies went flying. They couldn't see or smell or hear or anything. They looked like Christmas decorations. They looked like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. No shit. I drove through the gates, and right away a bunch of the ladies' auxiliary came running from the terminal building and closed the gates behind me. I think, like, two zombies got through, and Wolf killed them both, he added defensively. Danny shook her head. If you don't believe me, Patrick protested, the fire truck is right over there. Ask anybody. So how the hell do you know how to drive a fire truck? Patrick blushed. Oh, so I'm not man enough for that? I can choose the curtains, but I can't operate heavy machinery? Sarcasm was obviously lost on Danny. She waved her hand stump dismissively at Patrick. Fire trucks are complex. They're not cars. It was only a small one, like a moving truck. Danny stared at him, her eyes slitted with suspicion. I used to date a fireman, Patrick confessed. Danny found she could move around now without getting lightheaded. She felt good, despite the pain. After years of prescriptions and drinking, she felt as if all the poison had left her body. Maybe it had, running out of the infected stump of her hand. With Patrick's assistance, Danny took a tour of the junkyard. It was probably originally a place for salvaging parts and selling the rest for scrap metal, but clearly someone had loved the bits and pieces, because there was now a comprehensive auto-building workshop there, full-scale, if hand-built. They had independent generator power, tools, a spray booth, pneumatics. It wasn't state-of-the-art, but it was everything a fellow needed. The front gates were a masterpiece of folk art. Coyote skulls and deer antlers sprouted from a deadly-looking metal sculpture surmounting a pair of huge iron doors on two-foot hinges. The gate belonged on a medieval castle. The doors were studded with hubcaps and wheels. Each door must have weighed five tons, but they were nicely balanced. Topper gave Danny the tour of the facilities and lamented the previous owner was not among them. He was my kind of motherfucker, Topper intoned reverently. Then he helped Danny over to a rudely constructed garage, the door to which Ernie swung open on cue. Ta-da, Ernie said. It's not beautiful, Patrick said, but it has a certain something. Danny said nothing. She limped past Topper and circled the machine slowly. She could see the basic outline of the Chevy police special underneath. The paint was the same, but the vehicle had been built up from end to end. A frame of tubular steel, granular and blackened at the welds, mimicked the contours of the car, forming a cage around it. Panels of chain-link fence had been framed in iron and set into the tubular superstructure across all the windows. The doors had their own independent frames welded straight onto the sheet metal. A row of mismatched off-road lamps were mounted on the roof above the police flashers, at each end of the car, the factory bumpers had been pulled off and replaced with railroad ties, bolted on and bound with thick steel rope. 
Projecting out of the railroad ties was a pair of arms that extended two feet beyond the nose of the vehicle. Between the arms was stretched a length of slender cable. That what I think it is? Danny said at last. She gestured at the cable with her injured hand. It's for cutting cheese, Topper said. When Danny said nothing else, Topper added, It's not done yet. We'd like to reduce the weight some, maybe get some gladiator action going. It's good, Danny said, realizing she needed to say something. Damn good. When the following dawn came, Danny had been awake for hours, contemplating the options before her. There was a quotation she remembered from Sun Tzu's Art of War, good advice even 2,600 years later. Do not interfere with an army that is returning home. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free. Do not press a desperate foe too hard. It was time to create an outlet. 5. The shooting had stopped. Murdo sent several relays of civilians out. The women looked ridiculous in the oversized uniforms, but he even made Mrs. Tits go out holding a gun to Amy the veterinarian's head, and that didn't work either. The sniper was either holding fire, or, more likely, he'd been chased away or eaten by the Zeros. It was time to take a chance. Murdo had decided which of his men was going to take it. But when he brought the subject up, the first thing that happened was Estevez worked the chambering mechanism on his submachine gun and said, I think it's your turn, Mr. Man. Murdo shouted at them. He raged. They all stood there, bigger and meaner than him. And then he saw it. In a single gesture, assuming he survived, he could make himself into the commander again, the respected leader. He could turn himself into a legend. All he had to do was get out that door and across to the ASV. Once he was inside, he was safe. He was armed to the teeth, and he was back on top. He told them they were all pussies. Fuck it, man to do a man's job. He went to the front door, splintered with bullet holes from Patrick's escape, and opened it a crack. Nothing. That wasn't how the sniper operated. He was sure the gunman was up on the ridge line above the airfield. Where else could he be and not get bitten to death? But it was a mile of rough stone up there. A man could hide out for months in a place like that, picking off targets below. Murdo had spent time in Afghanistan with stone-cold killers who did exactly that for a living. Murdo knew what to do. Get into the gun turret of the ASV and blast off with the grenade launcher. Blow that whole ridgeline to shit. Even if the gunman wasn't up there, it would sure put the courage back in his boys. He was hoping somebody would tell him not to go. Don't risk it. Let me take your place. Nobody said a thing. Hyperventilating freely, Murdo drew his pistol, then kicked the door open and threw himself outside. He hit the ground painfully and rolled this way and that, thrusting himself from roll to roll with his legs. But he lost track of the ASV and all the rolling and worked his way too far out into the open. He wasn't dead yet, so he took a chance and scrambled to his feet and ran, body bent double to the shelter of the massive vehicle's flank. He climbed up into the side hatch, gasping for breath, soaked with perspiration. No rifle shots. He made it. That would show those assholes who had what it took. He reached down into the cockpit and switched on the power, then climbed up into the gunner's position. He would be exposed again, but he could keep his head down mostly because specific aim wasn't the issue here. Murdo powered up the weapon systems. There were still a few rounds left. Estevez talked like a big man, and yet he'd used up most of their explosives to blow up one little sports car. Murdo swung the turret around until the ridgeline crossed his sights, elevated almost as high as the system would go. The rock face towered above. He opened fire, swinging across the side of the mountain, then a second burst, swinging back, until the grenades ran out. The first salvo hit while the second was still on its way. The entire mountainside sprouted blossoms of smoke and debris. Then the second salvo of grenades stitched along the rock face below the first impacts, and Murdo was extremely pleased to see the entire damn cliff come apart in long, smoking fissures, then collapse with the slow, rumbling majesty of an iceberg calving into the sea. 
The roar of so much rock coming down was deafening. The whole world trembled. A solid wall of dust and smoke billowed up and swept toward the airfield, and Murdo bellowed in triumph. He had won. Then the airborne rain of broken stones came down. Murdo dove for cover inside the ASV. For twenty seconds, the rumble came whistling out of the sky. Glass broke, metal clanged and buckled, and the ground trembled with the hammering of rock. A boulder the size of a king mattress whirled down and cut the firefighting helicopter in half. Dozens of the undead outside the wire were struck down, some reduced to pulp. Then the cloud of dust from the hillside wafted across the rock-strewn asphalt, obscuring everything for twenty seconds. When the pall lifted, Murdo looked out of the turret to see what he had wrought. The airfield was almost in ruins. There were holes in the roofs, and the tower windows were shattered. Part of the fence at the far end of the runway had collapsed. The front of one of the Humvees was crushed in by a man-sized chunk of rock, and there were dents in all the rest of the vehicles, except the ASV, which had weathered the storm of rubble impassively, although it was thickly covered in debris. There were broken windows on the motor home, but it appeared to be intact otherwise. They might have a hard time driving across the parking area, though. There was that much rock thrown around. Unintended consequences, but who the fuck cared? He was the man. Murdo waved at the terminal building. He saw faces at the broken windows, having a hesitant look outside, afraid. Come on, you pussies. Roll out. Wolf was happy to see Danny conscious again, but he would have preferred to keep on plugging away until he got all the Hawkstone men. He was pretty sure he could do it. But, as usual, the sheriff insisted on moderation, on strategy. After all, the mercenaries might drive the women five miles up the road and leave them behind, not a shot fired or a life lost. So the men from the junkyard waited and watched. The spectacle of the mountain grenade bombing was worth the wait, certainly, although it looked for a while as if it had killed everyone below. You still wish you were up there? Danny asked Wolf. If I was up there, he wouldn't have lived long enough to do it, Wolf muttered. The problem now was that the fence was compromised. The zeros were gathered primarily at the near end, where the gates were, but there were some at the far end, and they had already discovered the breach in the defenses. It would take them some time to make it down the length of the runway, but they were inside the perimeter, and there would be more. However, as they watched, through telescope, binoculars, and rifle scopes, they saw knots of people coming out of the terminal building. The mercenaries were forming rings of civilians in case the gunman was still out there. I could make headshots there easy, Wolf said to nobody in particular. Danny was on the big telescope, but she couldn't discern who was who. She hoped Amy was down there among those hustling for the vehicles. Less than five minutes later, the convoy was rolling. They saw a bright flag of fire jump out of the 20-millimeter cannon on the ASV, and the swarm of zombies at the gate seemed to glitter and burst into confetti. Something from a parade. They heard the distant rattle of the cannon a few moments later. The undead were falling, cut to pieces. The roadway turned black with guts and blood. Then the ASV jumped forward and rammed the gates open. The convoy rolled through the gap, slowly, the cannon still sweeping the swarm, then picking up speed. The ASV was plowing through the fringes of the crowd now, and then they were all driving away down the road, the motorhome in the middle, the remaining Humvee at the back, and behind that stood what was left of Boscombe Field, the undead already stumbling in to claim it for themselves. Wolf's toy radio spoke. It stuttered and spat fragments of words. Ernie thumbed his on as well, and it echoed Wolf's. What band are those on? Danny asked. Fuck if I know, Ernie said. Any damn interference cuts him out. Danny understood. Toy transmitters, like these radios or remote-controlled cars, were designed to be easily overridden by stronger signals. It was a guarantee that some kid with a foot-long RC dune buggy wouldn't inadvertently cut out a fire department signal or a police radio, rendering communications impossible during an emergency. Some devices that were supposed to be safe for you still did it. 
Certain cordless phones, for example, could break up a transmission as a squad car rolled past the house. As the convoy rolled up the road toward their position, the puny little toy radios were picking up transmissions from the transceivers aboard the vehicles. The digital band signals would make no sense, of course. The military favored them for that reason, among many. Scrambled fragments of noise that had to be assembled into ones and noughts before a computer turned those into simulations of sounds. But the white whale didn't have a satellite radio. It was good old-fashioned citizens' band. That meant Danny might possibly get to listen in. They all watched and waited as the convoy rumbled away from the airfield, a plume of dust rising up behind it. They all listened as the toy radios muttered and squawked. Then chunks of intelligible speech came through, words and phrases, and finally Danny heard the word Potter. Patrick was right. Is that thing gassed up? Danny asked. I'd like to take it for a spin. Murdo led the convoy down the highway and was relieved to find far fewer zombies once they moved into the rougher hill country. They'd had to grease dozens of the things on the way to the main road, blowing them apart with a cannon or running them down. The massive swarm inching its way north through the lowlands worried him because Potter was northward. It also worried him, or bothered him, that his men hadn't given him credit for his courageous actions of the morning. Hadn't he gotten them out of that place? Hadn't he been the one who went outside and braved the gunfire? They had no appreciation. When he hooked up with command, he was going to request a new unit. These men were insubordinate. They would never stop laughing at him. Murdo understood that now. Never to his face, but the laughter would go on in private. It didn't matter. He had a plan, and he was going to make it work. Even if something was wrong at Potter, that was where the supply train had stopped. There would be material there. The train was presumably long gone, but the supplies would be there. He knew it because the last transmission they'd gotten from command was ten minutes before the train pulled into Potter. Command had been on the train, along with some fine war-making equipment and fifty seasoned men. It was all going to work out. Amy had seen the zombies surrounding the airfield, how dried out they looked and rotten. They couldn't last much longer. Their tissues would break down and they would collapse and die again, forever this time. If Murdo and his bunch of meat-headed killers could have been persuaded to pitch in instead of playing the heavies, they might have been able to hold out at the airfield even longer. They could have mounted some kind of defense. All of them together, the men, the women, the civilians, and professional soldiers, might have been able to accomplish something. As it was, all they had achieved was to render the airfield uninhabitable for the next people who came along. Yet another refuge from the undead, lost to stupidity and fear and violent thinking. When Murdo got to Potter, what would he find? More of his idiot companions marching around with their guns and gung-ho? Would they be driving around shooting up crowds of zombies, as they had done on the way out of the airfield? She remembered, when the gates swung open, how Reese, now in the driver's seat of the white whale, had screamed with excitement. The claws of the zombies had torn at the outside of the motor home, blackened fingers with the bones jutting out of them. The wheels of the heavy machine had spun in the greasy slick of bowels, dirt, and blood on the road. The smoke from the spinning tires stank of grilled meat, a smell that left a taste in the mouth. The survivors were weeping, holding each other. The baby, uncharacteristically, wailed. Then that huge tank thing of Murdo's had plowed a path through the bodies, and the tires of the whale had gripped, and they started to advance. They left the airfield behind, but the stink remained with them. Reese and Murdo were talking over the radio. Amy was listening. They all were. The question that hung over them was simple. Why had the mercenaries taken anybody with them? Before it made some kind of sense. They had hostages in case the menfolk tried something. But all the menfolk had done so far, and Amy was pretty sure this meant only Wolf, was shoot at them from a distance. Murdo made some cryptic remarks, couched in jargon that sounded like they might refer to the civilians. Mention of the cargo and tiger trap caught Amy's attention. But there was nothing specific. 
All she knew for certain was this wasn't a humanitarian gesture. They weren't being saved for the sake of saving them. Danny would have known what they were up to. Amy grieved for Danny, and on a bigger scale, she grieved for the brief possibility that if they all worked together, they could make some kind of future out of the disaster that had befallen the world. She didn't mourn for the murdered world, at least not in any direct sense. It had always been a strange, unforgiving place to her, all those people out there making each other miserable. They were still doing it, alive or dead. What she wanted was the chance to start over. That's what all this horror and destruction offered. A new start. Typical of human beings not to leap at the chance. There was a series of curt commands from Murdo, and the convoy rolled to a stop at the intersection of the road to the airport and the Ore Creek Highway. Shoshone Springs, the place was called. Amy assumed this was because there were no Native Americans and no springs there. But there was something written on the blacktop. They couldn't read what it said. The mass of the ASV blocked the view. Flamingo got out of the Humvee and checked the paint, held his fingers up to show Murdo, leaning out of the ASV's side door. Wet paint, Amy guessed. A minute later, the convoy was rolling again, heading in the direction of Potter. As they drove through the turn, Amy clamored over her miserable companions huddled in the living area and made it across the bedroom just in time to look out the back window and catch the message written in sprawling hot pink spray paint across the intersection. Potter equals death. Amy thought it looked like Danny's handwriting, but Danny, of course, was dead. Amy supposed she would be seeing Danny's handwriting everywhere for a while, until the memories faded. That is, if she was alive long enough for memories to fade. She might be seeing Danny quite soon, in the most morbid sense of the phrase. As the motorhome hummed down the open road toward whatever unpleasant destiny Murdo had prepared, Amy wished she believed in heaven. It was one of her favorite wishes, although she kept it a secret, even from Danny. She had a very specific vision of the afterlife. It was not white clouds and angels in the sky plucking harps. Amy's heaven was green fields and forests full of all the animals she'd ever known, and a few people, too. Danny would be there, at age sixteen, before life started beating the joy out of her. Amy thought of Danny again, probably half-eaten and rotten underneath the Mustang. Danny had a habit of mentioning things that would be heaven, but they were always excesses. If she could drink all night and not get hung over, that would be heaven. If she could fuck, eat, watch TV, and sleep at the same time, that would be heaven. The sun was starting its descent in the sky, its light glancing in across the floor through the rubble-starred windows of the RV, but there were many hours of daylight left. Amy wondered how many of those hours she would see, and once more wished her heaven was real. The convoy rolled over the last hill before Potter at four in the afternoon. They had made good time, but didn't rush it. Murdo knew there could be an ambush anywhere along the route. There had been three more graffiti warnings on the road, all of which he ignored. He knew that game. Get him to stop before he hooked up with reinforcements. Get him to doubt. Sow confusion among his men. Parker had threatened to stop the ASV at one point. The message on the road was especially dire. The Zeros can hunt men. What the fuck does that mean? Parker said. It means they're using psychological warfare, dumbass, Murdo explained. Estevez, up in the turret, didn't seem upset by the messages scrawled on the road, but then Murdo was pretty sure Estevez couldn't read. There was some back talk on the radio. Reese was on the verge of mutiny again, and Flamingo was shitting himself. How do we know it's their people, not ours? Flamingo asked. They used code zero, he added. Everybody knows code zero. Murdo replied. That fucking sheriff even knew it. It angered him to bring up the subject of that particular individual, so Murdo demanded five minutes of air silence. At last they were close. Murdo saw a cloud of birds in the sky. A dusty blue tarpaulin flapped across the road as they motored past a scenic overlook. And then they were on the hill above Potter. The town looked sleepy and dull and calm. 
There was a final remark written there on the road at the crest of the hill. So fresh, Murdo could smell the aerosol without descending from the M1117. It was straight to the point. The fuckers must have been running out of paint. You're dead. No, I'm not, Murdo said aloud. The tarpaulin caught the breeze and tumbled away over the hill like a loose patch of sky. Murdo climbed up next to Estevez in the turret of the M1117, took the lens caps off his binoculars, and scanned the town of Potter, California, for signs of Hawkstone's presence. And he couldn't believe his luck. There was the train, 300 feet of glorious Hawkstone camouflage, with the screaming eagle on the side and some serious rock and roll hardware on the flat cars in the rear. Five passenger cars that would carry upward of 90 men each. They were back in business. But things might not be as they seemed. He remembered the warning from the dead sheriff. The zeros are getting faster. Murdo was no fool. He brought all those troublesome civilian assholes for a reason. They were going to walk into town. If they made it, Murdo was going to drive. 6. The visibility in the firefighting mask wasn't very good and the oxygen cylinder on her back raised hell with the scars, but at least she wasn't leaving a plume of breath smell behind her. Danny was on foot. She knew something was wrong, even more wrong than the last time she was here. High overhead, a fleet of vultures was circling. The crows were watching from the trees and wires overhead. Days before, the streets of Potter had been strewn with ordinary corpses and comatose zeros waiting for prey hundreds of them. Now there were only corpses. The zeros were gone. And it wasn't because the zeros had finally perished of hunger. There weren't enough bodies in the street. Something had driven the undead out. Danny thought she knew what it was. She remembered the way the undead were massed along the barrier that divided San Francisco. Tens of thousands of them clawing at the wire and rubble, trying to get in. At the time, Danny had thought it odd that they were struggling at the barrier in such numbers. If they hunted by sense of smell, surely the smoke of the fires would have masked the breath of living things. They weren't supernatural. They operated according to simple rules. She couldn't believe they were smelling the humanity huddled downwind of them with the fires upwind. But Danny had had other things on her mind at the time. She dismissed the question because it didn't influence her hypothesis of the moment. But now, her boots gritting in the thick dust settled over Main Street, Danny thought the question had become pertinent in the extreme. She had a theory about what the Zeros had been doing back there at the barrier. They weren't trying to get at the humanity on the other side. They were trying to get away from the hunters on their side. She thought of the hunters how they moved so silently together, each working in concert with the rest of the pack. They had, was it discipline? Better instincts? They had the edge, Danny knew that much. And the more she thought about it, the more sure she became. The lesser ones, the moaning, stupid zombies, had been trying to escape the clever ones. Danny's mind was working fast, but her eyes kept watch on every angle of concealment, every possible approach, she needed to find a zombie. She didn't need them to find her. She thought of the mission she had undertaken in San Francisco, the slow specimens Danny and Magnuson had encountered on the freeway at first. They must not have known the swift ones were nearby. The hunters hadn't gotten onto the freeway until then. The clever dead were scavenging through the neighborhoods where the living could still be found, huddled in attics and back rooms, thinking they might survive. That was why the surface streets were unexpectedly crowded with the undead on the far side of the freeway. They were migrating, just like the ones out in the desert. Migrating away from the approach of the hunters from outside the city. It was the arrival of Danny and Magnuson that attracted the hunters to come up onto the road. Everything made sense when considered in this light. Danny felt sweat running down her sides and the prickling in her back was fierce. She carried a length of iron rod in her good hand, useful as a club, among other things. Over her stump hand, she wore something Topper had assembled to her specifications. It was a kind of steel glove, 
spattered with bright pink paint from the spray cans, shaped like a cowbell where it fitted over her hand and strapped to her wrist with a long belt of tire tube rubber. Welded to the end where her fingers would have been was a six-inch spike shaped like the tip of a fireplace poker, a stabbing point with a curved hook at the base. Danny's injury was encased in metal, only her thumb protruding through an opening in the side. Her main concern was avoiding infection. Not the zombie disease, to which she was apparently immune, but a rematch with the ordinary infection that had nearly killed her. She didn't anticipate using the spike as a weapon. It would probably hurt so much she would black out. It was a pity the Zeros were incapable of fear, Danny considered. They would fear this badass hook. Then it occurred to her the monsters could feel fear, but only of their own kind, and only of the superior ones, just like the living. The problem Danny hadn't anticipated was the absence of zombies. Without them, she would soon be nothing but another dead cop. But somehow, with the ones she'd seen before missing from the street, she thought the problem wasn't that there were no zombies in town. They were here. They were just a hell of a lot better at not being seen. She saw one at last, one of the stupid ones. It had a broken leg, the foot pointing around backward. It was dragging the limb along a side street that bordered the park at the edge of town opposite the hotel. Its course would take it out into the open desert. The park was a small wilderness of trees, dead rose bushes, and low walls, a lot of places a capable hunter could hide. But Danny had very little time to waste. It was this specimen, or she would have to switch to Plan B. And she didn't have a Plan B. She abandoned caution. Move. She came up swiftly behind the zombie. It was a female of middle size. Perfect. It lurched along beside a big stone Spanish-style fountain that hadn't worked in years, the centerpiece of the park back when railroads still meant something. Din-dins, Danny said her voice muffled by the firefighting mask. Yummy! She wished she could come up with better quips, but it worked. The zombie heard Danny and forgot its efforts to get away from town. It came for her, the broken leg bending at a nauseating angle as it reversed course. The thing was dried out looking, shriveled. The lips wouldn't close and the eyelids were stretched tight. The once brown hair now faded and dusty, missing in clumps. Its flesh looked too small for its skeleton. It followed Danny through the park. She hadn't anticipated finding one with a bad leg. It was taking forever. She could keep away from it at a stroll. But this was going to have to do. She only hoped the Hawkstone men didn't show up before she was ready. More than that, she hoped the hunters hadn't caught her scent. The breathing apparatus ought to help, but their senses were heightened. She could feel the cloudy eyes upon her, watching, waiting. She hoped that was only nerves. She checked the trees around her. The crows were still there. As long as the crows stayed in the trees, Danny was safe. The M1117 armored security vehicle idled near a small square stucco house outside of town. There was a concrete Virgin Mary in the front yard. Estevez had his hands on the firing grips of the 20 millimeter cannon, but Murdo had given him strict instructions not to shoot unless the women made a run for it. The civilians walked toward town with their hands up, except the woman carrying the baby. Murdo figured her hands were as good as up. The veterinarian was out front, stomping along so she would get killed first, or whatever her motivation was. Murdo guessed she was just trying to show them who was boss. Knock yourself out, Doc. Hope there ain't any zeros around. Reese was back up with the motor home, doing guard duty alongside the useless Jones. Reese was pissed about it, too, but Murdo wouldn't have minded being up there on the hill instead of heading down into this fucked up town. One thing was for sure. Murdo wasn't letting Reese and Ace do anything together. He didn't trust them. Murdo stood beside Estevez, searching town with the binoculars. His confidence that they had found Hawkstone's regional HQ was shaken by the fact that there was nobody around, no guards on the road into town. There were no men on the roofs. There was nobody moving around down by the hotel where he expected his people would have bunked up. 
They liked the best, did the Hawkstone Brass. It looked like a comfortable hotel. Amy's heart was slamming so hard she thought her ribs might come loose. Potter was where Danny had gone to look for Kelly. Danny came back alone, so no Kelly and Potter. That wasn't a good sign. The inch of dust and sand over the street wasn't a good sign either. The dark traffic lights, also not a good sign. The shrunken bodies lying in the gutters, not good either. Murdo had frog-marched them all out of the motorhome at the top of the hill. He said they were going to walk because he didn't trust them to behave. That meant nothing. Rather, he didn't have the guts to tell them they were bait. Murdo looked sick. His face was waxy. Amy thought it was raw fear she was seeing, because Murdo had been so very certain things were going to go his way in Potter. Now it appeared they might not. There was a huge train loaded with stuff at the station, but it was covered in dust. It had been there a while. If that was Murdo's headquarters, things might not be 100% awesome in Hawkstone's command structure. That is, unless Hawkstone was in the habit of abandoning its command posts. A whirling dust devil made its way through town. Amy studied Main Street as she approached it. There were bodies lying on the ground. They could be zombies or just dead bodies. She looked up at the vultures circling high overhead. There were crows in the trees. It was Troy Huppert who persuaded the rest of the men to let Danny go alone. He was the kind of man who kept in the background unless something needed doing. Troy liked Danny. He liked her a lot. While she was away on her adventures, he'd tried to figure out how he was going to take some role as a leader, and never got the hang of it. Too many alpha males in their group. It was a relief to have Danny back, the unstoppable alpha female. But now he understood something about her. She was going to do what she was going to do, and they would get by somehow whether she lived or died. Here she was, telling them she wanted to take her new car for a spin. She was surrounded by wrecked cars and a wrecked world. One hand chopped apart, beat all to hell, the customized police car idling at the open gates and saying she was going into town alone. Topper and Ernie started arguing right away. The others jumped in next, and you couldn't hear yourself think. They were all fired up to get down to Potter and make some noise. This was their fight, too. Danny was trying to explain what she had in mind. They weren't listening. Finally, Troy did a sharp two-finger whistle. Let the lady explain herself, he said. It worked. He so seldom pressed his will on the group, he had leverage just by the novelty of it. Danny nodded her appreciation. Listen up, because there's not much time, Danny said. I've been going solo for a while now, and I figured out it's a pretty good way to get things started. It's not a good way to get things finished. She can be taught, Patrick muttered. Danny was unconsciously massaging her primitive steel hand protector. Potter is full of the undead. These Hawkstone assholes are taking our friends there. They used Patrick as bait before, and I think that's what they're going to do with everybody else in Potter. That means they're not so sure Potter is a happening town anymore. The way I see it, they'll just keep sacrificing people until they hook up with their command unit. That means this is an ongoing situation. She looked around at the men, appraising them. Troy tried to imagine what Danny saw. Don, the plump older man, was starting to look like a tough guy, hands greasy, face suntanned. Patrick, with his busted face, looked like the toughest guy there. He probably was. The rest were looking pretty fit and capable, too. What had once been a random collection of isolated, scared individuals was now a team, after a fashion. And they were getting stronger, not weaker. Troy thought they might possibly get through this thing together. He hoped Danny felt the same way. Wolf, on lookout up above on the butte, broke into Troy's contemplations with a raucous shout. You better move your ass, Sheriff. They're coming. All eyes turned to Danny. Troy's heart was racing. He wanted to get moving. He'd do whatever it took. If we mount an assault, Danny continued, they will fuck us up royally. There is a 20 mil cannon on that M1117. There is a Ma Deuce on the Humvee. That's a 50 caliber Browning. They got all kinds of armament, and they're expecting trouble. What I got in mind is to use the zeros in town to our advantage, right? I won't be alone. I'm going to have an undead army at my back. 
For that, I gotta work solo. No, you fucking don't, Topper reasoned. Just listen, Danny said. I'm an expert by now. If I get killed, you all follow these boys and catch them at the next stop. But I'm not going to get killed. Oh, really, Patrick said in his most arch tone of voice. How do you know that? Because I can't fucking die, Danny said. And 70 seconds later, she was spray painting a message down at the intersection. Then she was accelerating her bizarre machine down Ore Creek Highway to Potter, opening up a long lead on the convoy still rumbling along the road that led from Boscombe Field. Somehow what Danny had said was frightening to Troy. It silenced the arguments. In a time when death was no longer final, immortality didn't seem far-fetched. But what chilled him to the core was the way she said it. With regret. In fact, Danny could absolutely die. That thought was uppermost in her mind. She saw the Hawkstone convoy at the crest of the hill into town, and she knew showtime was about to begin. The problem was, as far as she could tell, she had captured the only zero in town. The desert around Potter was swarming with them, but the city had been cleared out. Without zombies, she had absolutely no idea what to do. When she had told her guys back at the junkyard she was going to have her own army of the undead, it sounded crazy, but she felt like a snake charmer by now. She knew what to do and what she could get away with. The men understood that. If they came along with her, somebody was going to get jumped on or bitten, and then the whole scheme would fall apart. This was Danny's show, and hers alone. But now, sitting in the interceptor in an alley with a view of the hill and Main Street, she was starting to panic. Where the hell were the Zeros? It had never occurred to her the place would be free of the undead. She had taken it for granted they would be here. That was always the fatal mistake, taking anything for granted. She should be grateful the place wasn't swarming with walking corpses, and yet they had become part of her world. She needed them. Danny watched the convoy stop and saw the Hawkstone mercenaries shoving the civilians out of the White Whale. She saw her friends begin the march down the hill into town, hands raised like prisoners of war. She briefly lost sight of the ASV and the Humvee. They were among the buildings of town now, moving in and out of view, creeping along behind the hostages. Danny was positioned among the low, wood-framed buildings on the hill that rolled down through Potter and ended in the steep embankment above the train station. She decided that Plan B was going to be Plan A without the possibility of her own personal survival. That would have to do. In a few moments, the hostages would cross the end of the alley that opened onto Main Street. She would let them pass. Then the ASV would roll by. She would let that pass. When the Humvee reached the end of the alley, she was going to charge. With any luck, she wouldn't break her neck on impact, and the attack would draw the attention and the fire of the ASV crew. At that point, with the guns pointing in the opposite direction, the hostages were going to have to scatter and run for it. Danny expected they wouldn't need coaching. Patrick and the rest would come get them later on. Danny was sure her men weren't far behind, probably waiting on the other side of the hill to see how things went down. By that time, the Hawkstone boys would be long gone. At least Danny would have the satisfaction of killing one of them if she hit the Humvee squarely in the driver's side door. Danny's good hand was slick with sweat on the wheel of the interceptor. By now, the mercenaries would be able to see the decoy she'd set up, the decoy that required a street full of zombies. It would give them something to wonder about, but it was no longer part of the plan. Murdo told Parker to stop. He was up in the turret with Estevez, suffocating from the man's rank armpit smell. The women, led by the veterinarian, stood in the street ahead of the ASV. The hotel was off to the right, on a steep embankment with the train station below it, the rest of town to the left on a hill. There was a park up there, dying from lack of irrigation. Rows of shitty brick and clabbered buildings. This was a two-story town at best. It was all mud-colored from the dust and sand. There were bodies on the ground, but they didn't look like zeros. They were bird-eaten and stiff. There was no sign of a hawkstone welcoming party, nothing. The town was deserted. 
Except up ahead, halfway down Main Street in front of the hotel, there was a police car, or what used to be a police car. It had some kind of frame built around it and wire mesh over all the windows, and a massive timber fender that made the front end look like a siege weapon. The roof lights were flashing red, white, and blue. Even 200 yards away, Murdo could see the silhouette of the driver inside, wearing one of those campaign hats. Whoever this lone wolf cop was, they had about 10 seconds to get the fuck out of town. Then Parker said, Radio for you, boss. Tell him to get the fuck out of the way. It ain't a him, Murdo. A trickle of premonitory alarm ran down Murdo's back. He climbed awkwardly down inside the ASV and jacked himself into the passenger seat, from which he could see the cop car up ahead through the narrow forewindow. The civilian women were starting to put their hands down, looking around, looking back at the ASV. He thought of telling Estevez to shoot one of them to keep the rest in line, but he didn't think Estevez would be able to stop at one. Instead, Murdo took up the radio handset. Police band, Parker said. This is the unit commander, Murdo said into the microphone. Let them go, a voice said, low, dry, and cold, but a woman's voice. Murdo had heard that voice before. An iron fist clenched itself around his heart. My fucking God, he thought, back from the dead. I guess we didn't finish you off, Murdo said, trying for a jaunty tone of voice. He wanted to get a little patronizing chuckle in there, but it came out as a kind of click in the back of his throat. He swallowed. His mouth was dry. She couldn't possibly still be alive. Let them go and I let you live, the voice said. Murdo found himself studying the grotesque vehicle down the street. Was it wired up with explosives? Suicide bomb? Was there a rocket launcher on the back? He couldn't see anything. He cut his eyes up around the rooftops. Could be a trap. Could be that sniper was still around. Quit bluffing with us, bitch, Murdo said. He was letting his nerves get away from him. He was sitting inside an impregnable steel fortress. Even rockets wouldn't be effective against the mighty M1117, even a car bomb. Somebody might pick off Estevez up in the turret, but Murdo was untouchable. Get on the horn to back up one, Murdo called up to Estevez. Tell them to look for a sniper. Tell them to light up anything that moves. Estevez relayed the message on his satellite radio. Ace and Flamingo were back in the Humvee. With Flamingo on the heavy machine gun, Murdo had a further tactical advantage. Anybody who exposed him or herself to attack the ASV would have to face annihilation from the Humvee. You got ten seconds, the woman on the radio said. She has balls, Murdo thought. At least one aspect of her plan worked like a charm. Danny had watched the women troop past the alley entrance. Amy was out front. Danny's heart heated up at the sight of her, maybe the last sight she'd have. Then the ASV went past, its huge wheels turning slowly. Nobody saw her. They wouldn't. She had thrown a couple of hotel bedspreads over the roof of the interceptor and parked it in the shade of a carport well up the alley. It was only another abandoned vehicle in a town full of them. This interceptor was the one she had parked on the scenic outlook during her first foray into Potter, leaving it behind in favor of the Mustang. Nobody had molested the vehicle in the interim. It slept beneath the blue tarpaulin, dreaming of high-speed chases. It was a damn good car. Almost, but not quite, a pity to destroy it. A few seconds after the ASV, the Hummer crept into view and stopped three quarters of its length exposed to the alley. The driver's door was dead center of the intersection. There was a man up on the machine gun and a man at the wheel. Danny could see their faces. She could see their mouths moving. She watched as the gunner spoke on his walkie-talkie. So they were, of course, strategizing their next move, while Murdo, the boss, kept her on the radio. She was using the radio in her car, but of course Murdo didn't know that. Danny had to time this thing right. If she waited too long, Murdo would instruct his man on the cannon to blast the customized police special apart, which would mean firing right over the heads of the women hostages, 
or possibly through them. If Danny attacked too soon, they might still have the advantage of adrenaline and get a bead on her. She was delaying only long enough for them to become accustomed to the situation, letting them focus their attention ahead, put their machines into neutral gear, maybe even switch off the motors. The decoy was turning out to be useful after all. Murdo thought he was talking to the figure inside the custom special, the one wearing the smoky hat. He couldn't possibly know it was a living corpse, handcuffed to the steering wheel. The idea was to crush the Humvee's driver, then shoot the gunner before he could bring the 50 caliber machine gun around. If she could still move after that, Danny was going to draw fire from the ASV. The women were going to escape. She was in the groove now, like a sniper with the target in her sights, finger compressing the trigger, a couple of foot-pounds of pressure away from making the shot with the target completely unawares. And then a new variable entered the situation. As one, the crows rose up. Amy saw it at the same moment. All over town, the crows started clacking and cawing and flapped into the air. Survivors, those birds. They would be the dominant species someday. When Amy saw them take flight, she knew the danger was no longer from the cannon mounted on the rolling castle behind her. It was somewhere out there in town, not far away, coming closer. Possibly all around them. Where were the undead? She knew the place ought to be swarming, and yet she and her fellow survivors were the only biped standing. The vehicles had stopped behind them, and Tattoo Face had told them to stop, so they did, but now they were just standing around like idiots out in the open. They were staring at the strange police car. It looked like some squat, prehistoric swamp creature, snouted like an alligator. At first, Amy thought it was some crazy local yokel playing road warrior to pass the time of day. Then she thought, maybe it's Danny. But the figure inside the car, although difficult to make out behind the wire mesh and steel pipe, didn't move like Danny. It almost appeared to be struggling. Besides, Danny was dead. Hey, guys, Amy said, keeping her back to the ASV and her eyes on the custom police special. Yeah, it was Becky who answered, but the other women stopped whispering among themselves. Couple of things, Amy went on. First thing, we got this cop in front of us and Turdo behind us, so I think there might be some shooting. Don't move. She added this when she heard feet scuffling in the dirt on the pavement. Don't do anything sudden. It was important she keep her voice level and even, so nobody panicked, but they needed to do what she said. What I think we better get ready to do is run both ways, okay? Side to side. If you run down the middle of the street, they'll get you. And everybody scatter. Go a different way. We can get out of sight in a jiffy if we go left and right behind these buildings. When do we run? A voice hissed. It was Linda Moss. She was clutching Michelle and Jimmy James to her bosom, frightening them even further. I'm not done, Amy said. There's another thing. See those crows? They fly away when there's zombies around. They just did, said Pfeiffer her voice cracking with fear. Yes, they did, Amy continued, her tone as level as she could muster. Crows just love to do that. So when you run, don't run off anywhere you can't get out of, okay? Just get away from these bad guys behind us. If I were you, I'd double back the way we came in. It felt as if they had been standing in the street for a long time. In reality, it was under a minute since Murdo had called the procession to a halt, but with every second that passed, they got closer to something happening. The crows told Amy that. Even if the shooting never started, something else was going to happen. The shooting, however, was sure to begin. And soon. Amy? It was Michelle. So far, Amy had kept her feelings out of the situation. It was a simple matter of survival, like trying to get control of a car that was skidding on ice. When Michelle spoke, it added a personal element. She was reminded there were kids in the back seat of the skidding car. Amy took a breath. So little time left. Yeah? Should me and Jimmy James go the same way, or should we scatter? You two scatter in the same direction. Thanks. Don't mention it. 
Amy thought she might choke up if the girl didn't stop talking. Although Amy was facing the wrong way to see anybody except the odd shape of the cop inside the custom car, she could picture Michelle, her scabby knees, the blue hair with the pale roots starting to show. The crows reached altitude and circled over town, the vultures above them, wheeling in the upper atmosphere. Any second now. Amy? It was Becky again. You guys ready? Amy was tensing to run, although she hadn't altered her posture. Hang on, Amy. Uh, who's that? Amy looked over her shoulder. Becky was holding her friend by the shoulder. Amy couldn't remember the friend's name. She was pointing off toward the hotel. Amy followed her line of sight. She saw it, too. There was someone watching them from the parking lot of the hotel, crouched behind a minivan. Amy looked around again at the silent town. There was someone else hiding up there in the park, a couple of people, watching, motionless, hunkered down among the dead bushes. There, said Linda Moss. Amy looked where she was pointing. Beneath one of the dust-coated cars on Main Street beyond the police cruiser, the dark shape of a pair of feet was visible. There were others, too. The scene looked empty at a glance, but they were far from alone. Amy wondered who they were and why they were taking this risk. Don't point, she said. Don't let Turdo know they're here. There's something weird about them, Jimmy James said in his small flute voice. Amy saw it, too. They all saw it. It crossed Amy's mind that things might have gone from bad to infinitely worse. Inside the ASV, Murdo was sweating and angry. There was always some fucking thing. He made an executive decision. You know what? He said. Fuck it. Estevez, open fire. Danny glanced at the crows fluttering up in the air. A murder of crows, she remembered. A muster of storks, a parliament of owls. Amy had taught her those terms a swarm of zeros. She couldn't tell which way the threat was coming from. The crows lacked discipline. They took to the air without direction, which could also mean the threat came from everywhere. In practical terms, what this meant for Danny was she was out of time. She reached her good hand to the ignition key, preparing to twist it and fire up the engine. The men in the Humvee were looking anywhere but her position. She could make the distance down the alley in only a few seconds. This was her chance. Just as Danny's fingers flexed to turn the key, she saw motion on the edge of her vision. She flicked her eyes to the rearview mirror, looking back along the alley. There was a human shape in the doorway opposite, staring at her, hidden in the shadow, crouching down, still and intent. Its lard colored eyes were fixed upon Danny. Its shrunken fingers were reaching out. Hunters, Danny thought. Almost got me, you fucker. She didn't know it but she was growling. Then she heard the 20 millimeter cannon rattle into action. Too late, the voice said. In the same instant, Danny fired the ignition, stomped on the gas, and the Impala sprang forward, the engine's ungoverned 200 horsepower devouring the length of the alley. Her ears rang with the machine-made thunder of the cannon. Too late. The driver of the Humvee twisted his head around and saw the interceptor roaring toward him. The noise of the big gun had masked the sound of the motor. It was the motion that caught his attention. Danny could see his blue eyes widen, black brows flying up, then his shoulder twisted as he reached for the starter switch. Too late. The gunner up above was already swinging the 50 caliber machine gun around, but he had a full 200 degree turn to make before the muzzle came to bear on her too late. The interceptor hit the Humvee with the force of a wrecking ball. Acceleration had raised the nose of the police car up several inches, but it still lacked the height required to clear the heavy chassis of the target. The impact, however, was of such power that the engine block of the interceptor was driven into the Humvee's front door, buckling the panel into the driver's position. The entire machine was thrust sideways five feet across Main Street tires barking. Danny was wearing her seatbelt when she struck the larger machine. 
One twenty-fifth of a second after impact, both front airbags were fully deployed. The interceptor's nose collapsed according to its design, crumpling like an accordion around the engine. Danny was hurled forward, then backward against her seat. The interceptor filled with cornstarch dust from the airbag. Small objects flew around the cabin. Danny had meticulously cleared whatever she could find from the front of the interceptor that might turn into a projectile, but there was always something. Loose change and paper clips. Every pane of glass in the interceptor shattered, bursting apart into sparkling crumbs. Danny's arms flailed helplessly on impact, human muscle incapable of resisting the G-forces generated by a sudden stop. Her hook hand slammed into the dashboard. The steering wheel bent. The interceptor came to a halt, puking gasoline and antifreeze from its guts. Danny's advantage was surprise. She knew what was coming. It was going to be another debilitating hammer blow to her abused body, of course, but she had made what preparations she could. Her mind blinked on and off for a few moments after the crash, but then she was present again, looking up past the flaccid call of the airbag and the empty windshield frame at the side of the Humvee. There was blood on the remaining glass in that vehicle, and the gunner was slumping down inside the cabin, clutching his broken face. She hadn't wasted her chance. Then the pain from her crippled hand came roaring up, and for a few seconds, Danny thought she wasn't going to be able to do anything else. The pain turned her entire side into fire and blue light, screaming. Every severed nerve in her knuckles awoke and cried out. Danny gasped, her eyes rolling, and writhed against the seatbelt. Then the wave of pain became a steady hammering, and she was back in action. The door was jammed tight. She got the belt off and crawled out of the empty window frame. Danny's legs wouldn't hold her, but she was going to have to get around behind the vehicles, because the 20 millimeter cannon up ahead would be coming around at any moment. She used the Impala for support and staggered behind it, reaching her shotgun out of the back seat. It was in working order. Time to get ill, as the saying went. Danny could feel the steel sleeve over her amputation filling with hot liquid, certainly blood. And then she remembered the zero. The hunters were in town. Despite everything happening in front, she was going to have to watch her back. Her feet were responding again, so she made it around behind the Humvee. She was about to commit to her next move when it came at her, talons outstretched. Amy heard the whine of the cannon powering up. They all knew the sound from the demonstration they had received back at the airfield. She didn't have to say anything. Whoever the watchers hiding in the shadows were, it was time to get moving. The women scattered. Because she was facing the wrong way, Amy didn't get a chance to see if anybody but herself survived the initial explosion of cannon fire. She took a single thigh-stretching step, then threw herself headlong at the building to her left. There was no sound except the pounding of the cannon. She felt the projectiles tearing her apart, but they weren't. She was still alive. She threw herself forward again and hit something hard. It was the wall of the building. She scrambled around the corner, got to her feet, and began to run. There was someone else beside her, and someone behind. Who they were, or how many, she did not know. Then the watchers that had been hidden all around them emerged from concealment, teeth bared, arms outstretched. Amy saw them for what they were, and her fear took wing. If time had slowed around Danny when she charged the Humvee, now it was accelerating. Things were happening at a furious pace, events flashing before her eyes in staccato bursts. Danny stabbed the Zero in the face as it reached for her, its momentum jamming her crude weapon into its head until the hilt grated against its eye socket. She pulled the spear tip out, kicked the creature back, and shot it. When the 20 millimeter had opened fire less than a minute before, a strange kind of emptiness had come. With the sound of the cannon came the end of Amy, the end of old ties. Danny had come back for them, and this was her penance. She had only to complete her task, as much of it as she could, before she was herself cut down or torn to pieces. Then they would have to get by without her. She would die before she was done. There was an inevitability to that. None of this was articulated in her mind. She thought only two words. Too late. They encompassed all the rest. 
The cannon had stopped firing after a single burst. They would know something was happening behind them now. Danny fired the shotgun twice into the Humvee. She didn't waste time aiming, but held the weapon over her head through the tailgate and pumped the trigger. Two of the undead swarmed into the cab of the Humvee as Danny got away from it, and there was the ASV ahead of her with white gun smoke drifting away in the sunlight. The periods of transition from place to place seemed not to occur. Danny was here and then there where the next thing would happen. Another of the hunting undead was behind her. She turned and fired, and the thing was thrown off its feet. Danny shoved her back against the nearest wall, then ran forward. Up past the Humvee, the ASV's cannon was swiveling around in the turret. She had to get close, below the maximum depression of the barrel. All the deserts she'd ever fought in were blending together now, all the enemies. They were all thin shadows, flickering beneath a bright, endless sun. Murdo saw the dragon's beard of cannon fire leap out over his head at the civilians, who were already scattering in every direction. The boom of the gun was deafening, a blanket of noise. One of the women, the dumpy one who cried all the time, spun and fell with her arm blown off at the shoulder. The rest were gone in a few strides. The tracers streaked down the length of Main Street, then caught the customized police cruiser. The lights on the roof exploded, red and blue plastic and shivers of chrome. The roof itself buckled and rippled with the impacts. Estevez was an artist. Chunks flew out of the tubular frame. He concentrated fire on the driver's side, and the occupant exploded. Estevez released the firing grips. There was a problem. The blood spilling out of the police car was black, not red. And now there were gunshots. Everything was happening too fast. Behind us, Murdo said, and Parker switched on the rearview camera, just in time to see the dead sheriff rushing at them with a shotgun. Parker threw the machine into reverse and powered it backward. The aft camera revealed a scene of carnage that had been masked by the roar of the cannon. The Humvee had been slammed into by a second police cruiser. Murdo understood in an instant. They'd been decoyed. They had stopped where she wanted them to stop, at the intervals she had expected, just like well-trained men. And then she fucked them up. It didn't look, from the bouncing, chaotic camera picture, as if anyone else was moving around back there. The sheriff was there in the middle of the street, and then she dropped, and the M1117 rushed over her. Parker slammed backward into the Humvee, pushing it into the wall of the building beside it. That's how... Murdo said, offering a high five to Parker. Then he looked out the front porthole and saw the sheriff getting back on her feet. With the M1117's 18 inches of ground clearance, all she had to do was lie down. She was making fools out of them. And now Murdo saw the game. The whole thing was clear. The sheriff had friends with her, a bunch of Arabs it looked like, dark people with white teeth. Except she was running from them, shooting at them. They were after her. Oh, fuck, Parker said. They were zeros, and they were running, loping along like apes, but fast. Estevez opened fire with the cannon, and half a dozen of the things flew apart. In the distance, the rose bushes in the park shivered and spat leaves as the rounds flew through them. The fountain in the middle of the park disintegrated. Craters appeared across the landscape, from which leaped columns of earth, Murdo had lost track of the sheriff now. She was the one. They had to stop her above all. But she seemed to have disappeared. Reload me, Estevez shouted. Then the battered wreck of the custom police cruiser on Main Street shuddered to life. A gleaming hook tore out the remains of the windshield. The sheriff was inside it. And she was going to charge them. Amy ran for her life. This way a voice said, and because it was in her left ear, she went left. There was a black rectangle. She ran inside and slammed into something and fell. There was a bang and darkness. They were inside a building. One of the things hit the other side of the door and started hammering on the wood. Hands grabbed Amy and pulled her to her feet, and now they were running again, almost dancing between the objects inside the building. Storerooms and narrow corridors, it smelled of must and mildew. Then a large room with timbers overhead, 
Dark, a million chairs and tables, tinware and cabinets. It was an antique shop, unlit except for a patch of sun on the floor that fell through the dust-clotted picture window on Main Street. Michelle and Jimmy James were with her, running ahead of her in the shop. Amy ran after them, then hesitated, because she saw a strange vision through the window. The children were exhorting her to hurry up, but Amy had this vision to contend with. It was Danny out there on Main Street. Danny with a shotgun, falling, and then the massive war vehicle went straight over her and crashed into something beyond where she could see. The next thing she saw was Danny on her feet again. Amy didn't understand. It was a vision, that was all. A door crashed open elsewhere in the building, and Amy followed the children through an opening on the other side. Danny couldn't believe her luck when the police customs engine started. The gunner had concentrated his fire on the upper half of the vehicle. The power plant was intact. A couple of rounds had hit the cable-bound railroad ties on the front, but hadn't punched anything vital. The roof, however, looked like a big rumpled piece of metallic lace. The pillars that supported it were battered out of recognition. The interior was soaked in zombie guts and stank, but it wasn't the worst Danny had been through. Blood was flowing down her elbow from inside the steel amputation guard on her left hand. The spear point was bent. She had almost stabbed herself with it while clambering into the vehicle. No need to release the handcuffs with which she had bound the broken-legged zombie to the steering wheel. Its arms were still cuffed in place, but the rest of the thing was gone. With her good hand, Danny fired the shotgun twice, cleaning a couple of the fast zeros off the roof. They were prying at the metal, trying to get in. She sank the accelerator to the floor and the machine responded, picking up speed. The M1117 Guardian rolled forward like a maddened bull accepting the challenge of a matador. Its mill-wheel-sized tires churned the dust as it sped up. The distance between the vehicles was around 200 meters. Danny had a loose idea of what she wanted to do. The hotel flashed away behind her on the left, then the parking lot where she'd found the Mustang. A Hunter Zero threw itself at her vehicle, and one of the custom overriders that projected from the railroad tie fender sank into its bony chest. The thing snapped its jaws, struggled, and was sucked under the wheels. Danny lost no speed, gathering momentum. Now the ASV was advancing fast, blotting out the sky like a battleship from her low perspective. The embankment alongside the hotel whipped past Danny next, with its ornamental steps down to the railroad station. Danny almost felt she was flying. In a few moments, they would collide. Run her the fuck down, Murdo shouted, hysterical with rage. Parker gunned the engine, and the ASV surged forward toward the chewed-up carcass of the ugly police machine. Reload me, Estevez shouted again. Hang on, bitch, Murdo shouted back. We're playing fucking chicken. Estevez came down out of the tower and grabbed a couple of handholds. He couldn't see forward from his position, but Murdo was making it perfectly clear what was happening. Run her the fuck down! She dodges, you go the same fucking way. This is the end game. She can't fucking touch us up here. The distance was closing. The cruiser moved out of the shadow of the hotel, then it was out in the open, revving hard along Main Street with the panoramic view of the supply train down below. When this was over, Murdo was going to power that train up and drive it to Colorado if he could. They would join up with Base HQ there. One thing he goddamn well wasn't going to do was stay here with zombies that could run and hunt. Then he ran out of thoughts and braced himself, because impact was only seconds away. Amy followed the siblings through what seemed to be a private residence attached to the antique shop, itself a warren of junk and old broken things, but there was a cook stove and a wall phone and a few little islands of normal life in there. They held each other's hands to navigate the clutter. Behind them, the hunters were crashing through the showroom, smashing things, knocking over furniture as they made the straightest course possible for the source of the prey smell. The humans emerged, blinded by the sunlight after their brief journey through wooden caverns, on an alley. There was an awning overhead. At the end of the alley was a bloody mass of wreckage where a Humvee and a police car were tangled together, 
both stuck halfway into the side of the brick building opposite. Amy had to decide which way to run. Main Street was chaos, but wide open. The alley was narrow, and the things could trap them there. She heard a voice. It was Becky, at the far end of the alley at the top of the hill, waving. Then she ran. Amy tightened her grip on the children's hands and ran as fast as she could, towing them up the hill, braving the long, cluttered alleyway where anything could be waiting. Behind them, glass broke. A door banged open. The hunters were close behind them. Now all they could do was run and hope they ran faster than the undead. Somewhere down the hill there was a tremendous crash, the bright sound of metal crushing metal, and then a series of earth-shaking noises followed. Amy was hardly aware of this. All she heard was the pulse pounding in her ears, the slapping shoes and the gasping breath of the children beside her. When the sheriff yanked the wheel of the police car, it was the last possible instant. Too late to save her, Murdo knew. Too late. Parker, shouting in triumph, spun the wheel of the ASV at the same time, keeping the police special in his sights. And in that instant... Murdo saw what she had done. The sheriff had tricked them. Danny threw the wheel over. She could see into the cockpit of the ASV, time moving at impossible speed, but every fleeting impression as vivid as pictures hung on a wall. Crows in the blue sky above, brown-leaved trees. The massive grill of the ASV filling the passenger side windows of her vehicle, the nose of the police custom looking out over the train yard. Then the door was open, and Danny was tumbling through the air. She heard an almighty impact, but happened to be facing the ground when it happened. She hit the embankment and rolled. The chrome guard on her hand stump flew off, and she tucked the wounded limb in her belly and kept on rolling. When Danny came to a stop, she was sprawled on her back on the chipped concrete train platform. Ten yards away, the ASV was completing its second barrel roll down the embankment. It landed upside down, squarely on its roof, the turret jammed into the buckled cement like some apocalyptic electrical appliance plugged into the earth. The astonishing thing was, the machine appeared to be undamaged. It had rolled twice in twenty vertical feet down the steep embankment, and yet looked very much like all that was required was a tow truck to get it upright again, and it could roll away intact. Danny hoped the fuckers inside were dead, but she couldn't count on that. And they weren't trapped. The thing had hatches and doors all over it. Danny had to get to a weapon fast before they could emerge. She stood up, and if she'd been in a better frame of mind, she would have been pleased at the discovery that her limbs were mostly still working. She had thrown herself out of a speeding car and was pretty much uninjured, except for her hand stump, which was in trouble. The pain from that was so gigantic it was like the sound of a jackhammer. The ears went deaf from it. Her nerves were deaf from the shouting in her arm. Danny limped away down the platform, heading for the stairs. Then she saw them, three hunters peering down over the embankment. They were watching her. Two more appeared, one of them creeping forward onto the embankment in full view. They were getting bolder. Danny heard rustling in the bushes where the embankment became hillside again. It was time to move fast. Danny decided she didn't want to go back up to Main Street after all. She ran across the platform for the dusty train, closed herself in one of the passenger cars, crouched as low as she could, and ran to the far end of the car, then slipped out the opposite door on the desert side. She climbed down to the ground, then she limped along the tracks as fast as her aching limbs would take her, until Potter was out of view around a long geometric curve in the tracks that skirted the knee of a hulking rock formation. After a while, she was tired and lightheaded. She had made some distance, she thought. Danny sat down between the scorching hot rails, a small dark shape in the flat white salt of the desert. She let her finger stumps dribble blood on the iron of the rail. It sizzled and evaporated into little rusty coins with dark edges. The sun heliographed cryptic messages on the backs of her eyeballs. Did what I could, she thought. Then she fell over on her side and was still. 7. Murdo was the only one left alive. 
Estevez's skull was crushed. Parker's head was twisted almost back to front. Murdo found it ironic that Parker's enormous neck had failed him. They were all in a jumble in the upside-down cockpit of the ASV. Murdo's rage was gone. Now he was only afraid. He didn't know how Ace or Reese or Flamingo were doing, but maybe they were okay. He needed some help. Still, his luck was holding up pretty well. He had some bruises, a couple of cuts, sure, but he had survived. He was the survivor of all survivors, was Murdo. He reached down for the toggles that opened the roof hatch, now a floor hatch in the inverted vehicle. Something banged on the hull outside the ASV. Murdo shifted his weight and looked out the small front window, and his blood turned to snow. Outside there were four of the quick undead, the hunters he'd seen. They were right there, trying to figure out a way into the ASV. Murdo panicked. Bone-tipped fingers scratched at the bulletproof glass, digging along the edge of the panels. Could they get in through the turret? He drew his sidearm and crawled back to look, banging his knees. He had to crawl over Estevez's stinking corpse. There was daylight under there, but the turret opening was jammed right into the pavement. He was safe inside the ASV. He sat and waited. Time stopped going by. It waited with him. He listened to the claws scratching at the hull. There were more of them now, expressionless faces looking in with their lipless beaver teeth. They wanted him. They couldn't have him. He was secure inside his castle. But Parker might come back to life. Murdo hadn't thought of that. Estevez was thoroughly dead because his brains were showing, but Parker could maybe reanimate. Maybe. Murdo put his pistol to Parker's head and fired. The noise was sharp as a spike. Blood and brain matter sprayed all over everything. He should have planned it better. Murdo settled back again. He would wait. It was getting hotter and hotter inside the ASV, but he would wait. Hawkstone would send people back to look for them eventually. He could drink his own urine, even eat Estevez jerky if he had to. Stay alive, survive, and thrive. There were dozens of the things outside now. They were scrambling all over the exterior of the ASV, but they couldn't find a way in. So many of them were on the hull that the whole vehicle shifted slightly, its equilibrium changing. The turret grated loudly on the concrete. Slender, leathery fingers slipped through the spaces where there was a gap between turret and pavement. The light flickered as their shadows fell around the plugged-up opening. They were exploring. Murdo didn't think they could dig their way in. He'd shoot them if they tried it, and if he ran out of bullets, he'd crush their skulls. He was fine. He could wait. He crouched there in the dim, stifling cockpit, his knees drawn up, trying not to look at the wizened, hungry faces that crowded the windows, the bony fingers groping around the edges of the turret. He could wait forever if he had to. Eight. Wolf shot Reese. The Hawkstone mercenary had been perched on the roof of the RV, watching the progress of his comrades through binoculars. He had no idea that Danny's entire squad of hardened survivors was behind him, watching him, in turn, from vantage points up the hill. Gunfire erupted down in Potter, and Reese picked up his AR-15 rifle. He put the scope to his eye, searching for targets. Wolf figured Danny had enough going on without additional crossfire from above, so he tucked the beloved Winchester under his hairy cheek and shot Reese through the pelvis. The man dropped and rolled off the roof of the motorhome, thudding flat on the pavement. He tried to crawl under the machine. Wolf shot him again, but Reese was still moving. You're losing your touch, old timer, Topper remarked. You in some kind of fucking hurry, Wolf retorted. I'm just taking my time. They found Jones asleep in the back of the white whale. Wolf was all for skinning him alive. He's almost human, Patrick protested. This isn't his fault. Patrick convinced the others to let Jones live. Jones would certainly have died if not for Wolf's deliberate approach to mortally crippling Reese. Even Topper, who wanted revenge with an all-consuming thirst, was taken aback by that. Once Jones was bound up on the floor, the men fired up the engine and took the motorhome through town, searching for survivors. 
The undead hunters seemed to have gone away, although the crows were still aloft. Eventually, they found Amy and Michelle, Jimmy James and Becky, clutching the very quiet baby. They were hiding in a fuel storage shed where presumably the stink of kerosene was sufficient to conceal their presence. Once safe inside the whale, Becky confessed she was prepared to strangle the baby if he had made any noise while they were hiding. And she wept and squeezed him and woke the baby up. When they motored back up to the crest of the hill, Maria came running out of a small house with a concrete Virgin Mary out front. She had fled there from her own hiding place while the rest of them were searching for survivors in town. That was everybody there was. Pfeiffer and the others were gone, presumably butchered. Of Danny Adelman, there was no sign. Patrick couldn't bear the idea of leaving town without knowing. He wanted to look with their big telescope, to search all of Potter door to door. That's bullshit and you know it, Topper said. Whole new ball game. There are fast zombies out there, smart as coyotes. We don't fuck with that. Let's at least get up on the hill and see what we can see, Patrick said. It's open ground, Troy observed. Let's do what Patrick says. If those things try to get after us, we'll see them coming and we'll split. They agreed to delay for twenty minutes. Wolf and Patrick climbed up on the roof of the RV and watched. Wolf was looking for zombies. Patrick was looking for Danny. They sat up there, baking in the sun for the better part of half an hour, squinting through telescope and rifle sight. I see some of them things down there, Wolf said, breaking the silence, down by the train station. Is Danny, Patrick said. Well, I can't read their fucking name tags from here, Wolf explained. Then, after another pause, no, she ain't. It's zeros. They're trying to get into that big old personnel carrier. It's upside down. Fuckers must still be alive inside it. Guess that's why we have the town to ourselves. They got themselves a box lunch. Another ten minutes went by. It was time to pull out, but Patrick begged two more minutes. Wolf was getting agitated. He stank like a polecat in heat. I can't see him anywhere else, man. So what, Patrick said, disappointment giving way to anger. The enemy you can't see is the enemy that kills you. Wolf said. Oh, that ain't good, Wolf added. Patrick was so patently uninterested that Wolf started looking all around them, making a production of it, so it would be obvious they were about to be ambushed on all sides. Then he stopped, having seen something for real, and his big, bowed shoulders locked tight. Patrick saw the change in him. Are they ambushing us? he whispered, suddenly frightened. Somebody's down there. Give me that. Wolf handed Patrick his rifle and took the telescope. He sighted it out into the white, featureless plain of the desert, along the shore of which ran the railway. How the fuck do you focus this thing? I got it. Get your hands off. Wolf went silent, then emitted a long, wet whistle, watching the desert through the eyepiece. Well, goddamn. I found your girlfriend. Nine. All I ever do is wake up hurting, Danny thought. And then she woke up. Part five. Thereafter. One. The convoy rolled out every morning at first light. They shared watches in the nights, keeping to the wide open places where there was no cover for stalking and creeping and slinking up. The white whale took center position, with a tail of whatever vehicles they'd picked up along the way straggling out behind, sometimes joining the convoy for a few miles before turning off on their unknown errands, sometimes tagging along for days. A few stayed. Out front were the riders, the men on their rumbling bikes, a dangerous way to travel, but they were the eyes and ears. They could smell things, too, and darted like bees into the promising flowers to see if there was nectar to be had, big box stores with cracked parking lots from which weeds and bushes were beginning to rise. Downtowns of lost villages, sometimes long roads that left the main ways and disappeared into mountains or valleys where small populations of men could still be found, living in ways their ancestors would have understood. 
close to the land, no longer the top of the food chain. In the lead of the convoy, before even the bikers, was the interceptor. It was the third and best of them so far. They had the construction of the exoskeleton sorted out. It was rigid, but didn't add too much weight. The front fender was a wedge of steel with teeth cut into its leading edge. This caught the zeros and pulled them under the vehicle rather than throwing them up over the hood. Frames strung with piano wire protected the windows. Sheriff Adelman rode up there in the interceptor. Sometimes she would take a passenger, Patrick or Dr. Amy or one of the other long-timers, but often she drove on alone, the wind rustling the choppy red hair beneath her smoky hat. She seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of those hats. The convoy foraged to survive. There was so much unconsumed stuff out there in the countryside, food and supplies and needed things all embalmed in preservatives, bound in plastic and vacuum packs and cans and packets, hermetically sealed so it stayed good for damn near ever, regardless of the use-by date on the bottom. Those dates were slipping behind them now. You could get laid for a piece of fruit. Fresh things were best, but Adelman had her rules. You rode with her, you lived by them. They didn't touch orchards or crops unless they were clearly abandoned. Thou shalt not fuck up anybody else. Sometimes they bartered with the brave souls who stayed put to grow things. In addition, they didn't kill unless killed at, as some put it. They didn't take what wasn't offered, whether it was sex or a jar of pickles. These weren't complicated rules. If you broke them, you got left behind. A fate worse than death. There were troubles all over the land. It was like the Old West. Some folks took wild. They drove around raiding the fastnesses people had built up against the Zeros. No matter how clever the monsters got, they were never as cunning or dangerous as men. Men could light fires and build ladders. They could throw grappling hooks and wield knives. They could pretend to be scared, beg for help, then slaughter the men and rape the women dead. The undead were getting smarter, but they couldn't think the way men could. Tools were unknown to them, and language. They formed packs, hunting and feeding together and killing the slow, stupid zeros if they found them. They didn't breed. There were no alpha males or queens. They were all the same, eating machines that knew how to encircle and rush their prey and nothing more. Eventually, their clothes rotted off. The ones that fed often didn't decay. The ones that fell on lean times withered. If they withered enough the dull spark that animated them went out and they died for good. Their numbers were legion. Dying was complicated, but the rules for dying were simple. You had a choice. If you wanted to, you could live out your life to its last natural moment. After, when you opened your undead eyes, they shot you in the head. Or, if you knew your time was coming, you could have somebody shoot you while you were still alive. It was called sending you back. Being asked to do the shooting was considered a great honor. Sheriff Adelman got asked to send a lot of folks back. She never did. Nothing personal to the dying, of course. They didn't take it hard. A third way to die, which took a certain amount of chutzpah, was to shoot yourself. They called that warrior style. You got extra points for shooting yourself. Two. Five months after the crisis began, the world was different. It was greener. Mankind's stiff-armed distance from other forms of life had been relaxed. Small trees and grass and flowers grew through the cracks in the ocean of asphalt laid down by an ambitious species without a long-term plan. Animals roamed freely, their keen senses adapted to keeping them away from the undead. The skies were blue again over the cities. Great skylines of architecture had been blunted down, felled by fire and war-making, these sand-castle ruins subsequently flattened by epic rains that came that first winter. An earthquake, probably the big one except nobody measured it, sank San Francisco halfway into the bay. Men saw the cities fall but did not care. Fewer places for death to lie in wait. Nobody knew how many living human beings were left. The rest of the world was once more out of reach, a frightening place where mariners touched the fringes of land, then sailed on. 
There were stories of everywhere and news from nowhere. There was no internet, no telephone. Satellite communications were mostly lost. The ground systems required to track and maintain orbits had gone offline, and attempts to restore them failed because the satellites were lost in the sky. Many of those had already fallen. Some said China was almost intact and planning to invade the globe. The living death was of Chinese manufacture. That's why you never saw Chinese zeros. Others said the disease had come from the mass graves in Haiti, extracted by Nazi extremists planning to raise the Fourth Reich. Some said the American government had come up with the plague as a way to reinstate its crumbling empire. It was all bullshit and conjecture, idle talk to fill the hours of wakefulness before the sun came up. The zeros seemed to have reached their zenith. Their evolution peaked with the discovery that window glass could be broken with a stone. Have they continued to improve their intelligence and skill? Had they been able to think? Mankind would already have been extinct. Everyone agreed with that. Now mankind was engaged in a game of keep-away. If men could stop getting eaten for long enough, the zeros would rot away. The difficulty was men kept getting eaten. The monsters remained prosperous after their fashion. They felt no cold in winter unless they froze, in which case they were finished. Sometimes in the snow season, men would find ghouls in nests, hundreds strong, huddled in stinking cellars where the things waited out the storms like huge wingless bats. Their survival strategy seemed based on instincts dead for a million years in mortal men. They endured no pain, no fear, felt nothing but insatiable hunger. Their self-interest extended only as far as the feast. They did not need to think. Men, meanwhile, had begun thinking again in earnest. Danny's tribe moved slowly across the country. They weren't going anywhere in particular. The idea was simply to keep on going. They stayed sometimes in a promising place for a week at a time, then traveled on. Once they spent a month near the cracked and overflowing Hoover Dam. There was always something to move their band along. The zeros would get thicker in the area, or the survivors would hear rumors of an army of men coming, cannibals that styled themselves after the undead or destroyers, or zealots. The zealots angered Danny the most. The destroyers were hordes of nihilistic gangs that wrecked and killed and burned because, in their estimation, what was left of the world was trash anyway. They engaged the zeros in pitched battles and helped feed their numbers, suffering bites and infections that left the dying scattered along the roads. When Danny found them, they would be taken in and cared for until it was time to make the choice. The rest wandered off to die and came back ravening. The zealots believed the world was supposed to be like this. It was their beloved end times, and the hand of God was upon the land. They grew strong on their heady brand of magic, writing new chapters to append to the old Bible, full of portents and signs. They had rules, too, but their rules were arcane and punitive and cruel, Danny would find their victims nailed to crosses or burned at the stake. The living flocked to these preachers of death, who seemed to flourish more the worse things got. Danny might not have resented them if it was not for their insistence that joy and pleasure were abominations, as if God would relent only when the last smile was wiped from the last child's lips. Most of them didn't even allow music. The ones who did favored dirges and laments. Danny's tribe, now a hundred strong most times, had their own little woodstock nearly every Friday night, if there weren't zombies around. Music was all they had left. Art, movies, books, these things were artifacts that required carrying and preserving. Music you could conjure up from nothing, like fire. The latest of her working hypotheses had yielded two organizing principles toward which Danny moved her tribe. The first was a safe place. Safety was a far more transient thing than it appeared. Even the mightiest fortress would fall. So they moved along and found places that were safe for a while. But the place where the undead couldn't prosper, that place eluded them. Danny was sure there were tropical islands like that. She imagined Hawaii must be nice by now. 
but they were in the American West. So far, they'd never made it east of Kansas. The zeros were just too thick. Survivors said the eastern seaboard was an unrelieved nightmare. The second desirable outcome, from Danny's standpoint, was to find a cure. There were people of science working on it here and there, when they weren't fleeing for their lives. The virus that caused zombieism was known. It had a number. Some said it was surely a virus engineered to do what it did, a combination of this and that, until a perfectly lethal sickness was invented, not only deadly, but wicked. It was said that the virus was part mosquito, for the sense of smell, part hantavirus, for its ability to amplify so rapidly through the host. Other things. Rabies. Eye of Newt. It didn't matter. So far there was no cure, and no vaccine to immunize the living. Some people were born immune. Others carried the sickness inside them but did not sicken. Some got bitten, sickened, and survived. They were so few. In the spring, Danny's tribe picked up the trail of a larger band of people, run with fairness, according to homesteaders who encountered them in the occasional fortified settlements they passed. The larger band, calling themselves the Rovers, had their own set of rules and ran things along military lines. Discipline was tight, but it wasn't arbitrary. They were doing pretty well, folks said. Danny had a theory that groups could get too large for travel. She kept her band capped around 100 individuals, simply because beyond that she didn't recognize everybody. It got harder to gauge the merit of individuals. Cliques formed. Little knots of people started coming up with their own plans and rules, which inevitably ran at cross-purposes to the larger group. And it got harder to coordinate self-defense. Sure enough, as they got closer to the rovers, who moved more slowly due to sheer mass of numbers, the funeral pyres got taller. The rovers were decent about it, it seemed to Danny. They burned the undead in one pile and their dead in another. Most traveling bands left the undead where they lay, which poisoned the water supply and fouled the air. And the rovers left behind memorials. It was usually a piece of sheet metal with the names of the dead scribed into it, laid over the ashes, and held down with stones. As Danny's convoy crept closer to the larger party, day by mile, the pyres of the burned undead got smaller, and the pyres of the newly dead got bigger. Danny had taken to reading the lists of names scratched into the memorials. She didn't know about zombies in China, but people of every race and creed were still dying. Vehicles full of good supplies were often left behind. Danny found herself drinking more. She'd gotten it under control since the events at Potter, nerves buffered by routine, but the tension was getting to her. The funeral pyres showed up most often in the derelict towns the tribe passed through. Towns were deadly. The bigger, the more dangerous. People wandered away from the group, got greedy and went looting, found a nest of the undead and got bit. If their numbers were strong enough, the silent undead hunters would surround a foraging party and there would be a battle. One day they came upon a pyre of the dead around which the undead had been left where they fell, burned in place with hasty splashes of gasoline. Several vehicles had been left behind in what looked like a defensive ring. The list of the dead was written on a piece of cardboard held down with a brick. Danny read the list and wept, and nobody knew why. Most of them had never seen her respond with grief to anything. Will you find a nail or something and scratch these names onto a piece of metal? She asked Topper when he rode up to see what was happening. He and Ernie took care of the job and wondered about it. They didn't spend as much time with Danny these days. She seemed to have her own world around her. And besides, they had women of their own now. It was a shock to see her grieving. Two days later, they found a service center in the plains a little cluster of hotel, diner, truck stop, and bus station. The place had been looted long before, but still served as a waypoint. The names of different bands that had traveled that way were painted on the side of the motel. There were zeros strewn around. The remains hadn't been dealt with at all. Blood on the pavement. The human dead were heaped up and hastily set fire to. The remains, not ashes but roasted flesh, were still warm when the tribe rolled in. 
They had their own difficulties with the zeros in that area and lost a few people. Danny thought the proximity to the larger band put them at risk. The more of the living, the more of the undead. But they traveled on. There was no memorial in that place, and the dead went nameless. Danny asked Amy to ride with her that day. What's eating you? Amy asked as the miles rolled slowly beneath them. And then, so to speak. Remember Barry Davis? No. Was he the Davis's kid? Jesus, Amy. Well? Yes, he was the Davis's kid. I mean, anybody named Davis is the Davis's kid. But he was that kid of those Davises. He was going steady with Kelly. I didn't know that, Amy said. She had delivered a baby earlier that week, her first time with a human infant, and the thing was still alive. She only hoped the parents didn't blame her for how ugly it was. But the parents weren't exactly supermodels. Still, in the animal world, all babies are born beautiful. With humans, it was obviously different. He's dead, Danny said obviously expecting Amy would grasp the significance of that. She didn't. After Amy was silent a while, Danny explained. Barry Davis was Kelly's boyfriend, her real one, not all the imaginary ones I thought she had. He's in the note. They left Forest Peak together the morning everything went to shit. No way. Yes way. They drove in silence for a while. Do you like that guy in the old Toyota? The one who makes the guitars, Danny said. He's okay, Amy replied. The silence wore on. Remember that place where we found the ashes marked with cardboard, Danny said after a while. Yeah, you cried. Amy saw where Danny was going with the Barry Davis thing, and she didn't want to get into it. Danny had put her Kelly period behind her, although she still kept the filthy, tattered note in a plastic bag next to her heart. She was looking to the future again, even if she had no personal plans. The tribe gave her something to do, something to perpetuate. If Danny got thinking about the past, she was going to end up crazy and alone again. The thing is, Danny said, there was a Barry Davis on that list back there. It's not an unusual name, Amy protested. If he was like Barry Hashimoto, maybe, or Mogambo Davis. Still, it would explain why Danny was allowing the convoy to get closer to the rovers rather than falling back, as was her custom. She had found out the hard way that traveling bands of men don't mingle well. They're glad to meet, but once the drink flows, they're quick to fight. They mix up whose mate is whose. They have trouble coordinating night watches, and someone gets carried off in the night and their bones are never found. But now she was pushing to catch up, if anything. Danny had been urging them to pack their gear and get rolling much earlier than usual, and she rode herd longer into the afternoons. She and Amy passed the rest of the day's travel quietly, as old friends will. Both of them were thoughtful. The next day, they saw smoke. 3. They were somewhere in the Dakotas. The winter was coming. Danny thought they should probably head south before too long, Traveling was slower than ever, what with bridge collapses and little trees growing right in the middle of the interstates. If it got cold too soon, and the weather was wholly unpredictable now, they'd be stuck in some place living like Eskimos until spring. She had been pushing to get close to the rovers. She wanted to have a talk with their leaders, although perhaps as a solo envoy of her people, to save mixing with the larger band. They were obviously in disarray, and she didn't know how desperate they were. They might decide her orderly baggage train was just what they needed to put themselves right. Whatever plans she had made to that effect went out the armored window of her cruiser when she saw the smoke. It was a fire out in the prairie, the black smoke rising up against a gray, featureless sky that left the world without shadows. Her first instinct was to accelerate and catch up with the action, but she had people to take care of. She called a halt by the roadside. Recon was called for. Although this duty generally fell to the bikers, this time she wanted to join in. Topper and a big scar-faced man called Pike elected to come along. Topper had lost a lot of weight. 
There were no more heavy people in this world. He looked pretty good for an ugly bastard. Pike, on the other hand, made ugly an art form. As always when she rode out, Danny put Amy in charge. You never knew. What's happening? It was Patrick, come up from the middle of the column. He had weathered into his broken face, and he was tough as brass. He had a boyfriend, a guy from Philly who had walked and fought a thousand miles before he ran into the convoy. People called him Beowulf because his story sounded like something from Norse mythology. He'd killed hundreds of zombies entirely with hand weapons. Patrick had become very centered with him, more emotionally self-sufficient. Danny shook her head. Old business. You still think? Who knows, Danny said, but her eyes were on the horizon. She thought she knew. Remember, we're here, Patrick said. You're not alone. They drove down the interstate at refreshing speed, not having to keep slow for the white whale and the overloaded campers that made up the heart of the convoy. Danny kept her windows down and felt the freezing air blowing around her. It was that kind of weather, warm enough until the air started moving. Old thoughts Danny had buried in shallow graves were coming up. She banished their ghosts. Just go and see. Just go and see. It was a city, not just a town, one of those places that sprang up around a missile installation in the far end of nowhere, all built at the same time, with an army base and a high school, and somewhere to buy groceries. Then it grew, and some kind of industry came along, and the place thrived for a while, same as all such towns, with good suburbs and low-rent neighborhoods, competing schools, white-framed churches that stuck up like stalagmites. Then the downturn came and the place shriveled until it was half empty at best. Then the dead rose up, and now the city was empty altogether. They stopped at the only high place around, an overpass on the interstate where a local farm road passed beneath. Pike's motorcycle was a rat bike, a monstrous rusting piece of ironwork with scythe blades on the wheel hubs and ape hanger handlebars, a scrap metal beast. Topper rode a stock 75 Harley boat tail he'd liberated from an abandoned garage. They swapped a pair of binoculars back and forth. Nothing moved but the flames, so they followed the smoke. The heart of the city was on fire. On the outskirts of town, they found burning vehicles and signs of recent combat. Brass cartridges and incongruously colorful plastic shotgun casings were strewn around street corners where pitched battles had been waged. Vivid gore stood out in contrast to the drab masonry and faded tar. There were trails of blood, as if the pavement had been swabbed with blood-soaked mops. The bloodstains led toward the inner city, not away from it. Danny called off the search after only a few blocks. Whatever had happened here, it was only hours past. It looked like two competing nomadic groups had clashed. The tells of the fighting did not bear any resemblance to the pattern of zero assaults. This had been a two-sided confrontation lasting at least several minutes. The conflict had clearly been pressed from street to street. The undead didn't fight, they attacked. Lightly armed, Danny and her two companions were not going to profit from a chance encounter with either of the competing sides. As they made their way out of the city, they saw zombie blood. It was spattered on the ground and on the wall of desolate buildings. The fallen undead had been dragged away as well. With that, Danny was familiar. It was the mark of the rovers. Why then were those bodies dragged in the opposite direction from the red-blooded corpses of the recently alive? She and her companions followed the drag marks to where the black blood formed pools, after which the signs ended. The zombie remains had probably been loaded into a vehicle. Now that she had her back to the fire in the city, Danny could see a blurred finger of smoke rising from a suburb to the east. She consulted with Topper and Pike on whether they should pursue the matter, and the men said yes, because they could hear the urgency in Danny's voice. Got nowhere else to be, Topper said. They came to a broad concrete plaza overlooked by a jolly sheet metal clown. It was the entrance to a small amusement park. The plaza was surrounded by acres of parking. 
It was hard to imagine the place doing much business even in the best of times, but during the summer it might have been something to do with a boring Saturday. The parking lot was forested with lighting standards on which various comic characters were mounted. The lion was 3A, the monkey in a hat was 5G, and so forth. Beyond the entrance gates were ticket booths and turnstiles, and beyond those, a mock cowboy town with Victorian shop fronts, a saloon, and a carousel. Beyond the imitation town were thrill rides as still and faded as dried flowers, and at the far end of the park a couple of skeletal roller coasters hunched their spines. Opposite the amusement park was a shopping center. On the unobstructed sides there were views to the south that took in miles of featureless grassland, and to the north was the city. The pyre of corpses had been hastily arranged in the center of the plaza directly in front of the gate of the amusement park, where ornamental shrubbery had once spelled the name of the place, but was long dead and now illegible. When Danny, Topper, and Pike rode up to the crackling heap of corpses, they saw a Volkswagen microbus parked not far from the blaze. The windows of the bus were reinforced with barbed wire stapled to bolted-on wooden uprights. There was a woman sitting in the open side door, her head hanging. She held a pistol in her hand, loosely, drooping toward the ground, the way in an easier time she might have held a telephone handset after receiving bad news. When the woman heard the motors approaching, she turned her head to listen. At length, she looked up. Danny climbed out of the cruiser. The men stayed back. There was electricity in the air. Pike had it in mind to ask what was up, but thought better of it when Topper gave a single curt shake of his head. This might be a good time for a moment of silence. There are no coincidences, Harlan had once told Danny. It's only the odds coming due. Danny walked toward the woman in the bus and felt as if her legs had turned to new-fallen snow. They didn't feel substantial enough to hold her off the ground, but they kept moving, and she kept getting closer. And then they met. I got your note, Danny said. The men left them and went back to the convoy to deliver the news. The sheriff would be away for a few days. She was fine. She was dandy, in fact. But she had some family business to take care of. Sure, she'd catch up. Meanwhile, the doctor was in charge. Most folks didn't know the significance of this intelligence. Amy wanted to go to them right away, but Topper insisted. Danny had been very clear on the point. There was something new in that city. It was a trap. Something so dangerous they weren't going anywhere near. The sheriff would catch up with them. When had she failed to come back? Danny got Kelly into the cruiser with difficulty. She had great facility living with one functional hand now, and the builders in the tribe had an informal competition going for who could invent the most useful replacement for her severed fingers. Normally she wore an ordinary glove, but lugging a person who couldn't support her own weight, that took two hands. With Kelly arranged in the front seat, Danny got out of that cursed city. She headed south, because that's where the nearest road went. I got bit, Kelly said. It was the first time she'd spoken. Yeah, I see, Danny said. I'm sorry. She meant far more than sorry about the bite. Kelly nodded. She was tired. Not your fault, she said, and meant far more, too. Danny's mind was whirling. There was so much to say, so many things jumbled in her head. She wanted to hear more of that familiar voice coming from the thin, strong woman who looked so much like the girl who had run away, but was also someone else, someone entirely her own. It's good to see you, Kelly said, as they drove along the narrow two-lane road away from town. The tall grass on either side of them, pale and yellow, had been crops in past years. Now it was prairie again. Genetically modified corn couldn't compete with sturdy grass. Do you mind if I don't explain? Kelly continued. What happened back in Forest Peak, I mean. Just talk about what you want, Danny said. It's all past now. Grief was pulling her chest apart and cramming it into her throat. Kelly smiled a little. Let's skip the ancient history, then. You need to know what happened back there in town. They're smart, Danny, and fast. 
Yeah, Danny said, like wolves. No, like men, Kelly said. She had to stop for breath. There was a strip of gingham fabric bound around Kelly's wrist. It was bleeding through, right where a wristwatch should be. Her skin already had the pallor of the infected, as if she were turning slowly into limestone. Like men, she said again. They shot at us, Danny. They came after us with weapons. And they could talk. They weren't zeros then, they were cannibals. Not with black blood. Danny heard in Kelly's reply the old, exasperated tone of voice she'd heard so many times before. Big sister, why don't you listen? Danny remembered trying to convince Magnuson of the more able zombies back during her stint in San Francisco, and how frustrated she became when that woman wouldn't listen. She understood part of what it was like to be Kelly. The recognition fell into place in a moment, without articulate thought. I believe you, Danny said. I'm listening. These were words her sister had wanted to hear for many years of her short life. Kelly continued pausing now and then for breath, sinking slowly. They're like us, Danny. We never saw anything like it. They got us good. Killed a bunch of people. A few day back. I know, Danny said. I saw the marker. Kelly nodded. It was horrible. You gotta get away from the cities, Danny. This is new. It's made another evolution, a quantum leap. We're in a whole new kind of trouble. She paused, then smiled and focused her glassy eyes on Danny. You are, anyway. My troubles, you know, I'm almost out of troubles. As they drove, Kelly told Danny more about the attack, the dynamics of it. It was important, but Danny didn't care. She would use the information later. Now she was concentrating on the sound of her sister's voice, memorizing it the way she memorized the note. She had to remember this, all of this, because it was all she was going to get. Kelly told her then about how she had been bitten in the midst of hand-to-hand -hand combat with the undead, and she remarked on the irony of Danny's timing. Not that things wouldn't have happened the way they did, anyway. You could make up what-if scenarios all day long and it would never make any difference, Kelly said and paused for breath. There's only what is, she concluded. Despite her aching heart, Danny smiled. She had spent the better part of a year making up what-if scenarios. Her sister, meanwhile, had become philosophical in her old age. They came to a farmhouse, set back a little way from the road behind a couple of fields. Danny didn't bother with recon. She pulled up in the yard and helped Kelly out of the car, and Kelly used the shotgun as a crutch while Danny broke in through the front door. The house had the stagnant atmosphere of abandonment. If there were zeros here, they would be dealt with. For now, she made a fire in the dining room fireplace, breaking the chairs into kindling. Kelly sat in a dingy green velvet wing chair Danny dragged in from the living room. Danny put some bottled water to Kelly's lips, and her sister drank some, and the rest ran down her chin. There was nothing else to do. Kelly rested her head against one of the wings. You know the choice about dying, Kelly said. I decided to show I had the stones to do it myself. But when the others left me there, I couldn't. Five minutes before you showed up, I was trying to talk myself into it. Had the gun to my head. I think I could do it now, though. Do I bore you that bad? Danny said, aiming for a joke. It evaporated in the air. You're pretty famous, Kelly said. People have heard of you. I tell them I'm your sister. They say you dressed up in black leather and fought the Zeros at the Battle of the Bay and got a lot of people out of San Francisco. Danny didn't want to hurt her sister's feelings. She could hear the pride in the thin, faint voice. She bent the corners of her mouth up as if smiling. They say you're the one that warned them the Zeros were evolving, Kelly added. People escaped by sea. So maybe some of them had gotten out after all, Danny thought. The history was garbled, but none of that mattered. Danny knew her exploits got around, but it was only bull to keep the darkness at bay. If a few lives got saved, that was something real. Kelly fell silent and still. Danny was frightened. 
Kelly? What? Don't stop talking. I'm gonna have to. You know that. Until then. Danny's sinuses ached. Her eyeballs felt too big for their sockets. This wasn't the same as the grief she had felt when their parents died. It was bigger, something connected to the passage of such tempestuous time. She was twice the age now. There was so much more to be atoned for. Maybe you're immune, she said. Kelly lifted her good hand an inch above the arm of the chair, the closest she could get to a dismissive gesture. Don't go there. So, Danny said, trying to think of what they needed to catch up on before they parted ways. Uh, you had the same boyfriend this whole time. Barry, did you guys... I mean, were you in love? Nah. It was good to know somebody, though. And this whole time you traveled with the rovers? After they formed up, we were with some people before that, you know, just fighting and staying awake. I'm so tired now. I could really sleep. Sleep later, Danny said. Kelly didn't answer. Danny felt the panic come back. She was kneeling in front of Kelly now, watching. The gun was in Kelly's lap. It slipped, and Danny tried to catch it, but with her left hand. The gun bounced off her truncated palm and hit the floor. Kelly opened her eyes again. Danny, she said. I'm right here, Danny said. Kelly's eyes drifted around and found her. It's getting dark. I'm right here with you. It was afternoon. The sun came through the windows at a low angle, reaching from the front of the house into the back, the light creamy with dust motes. It would be getting dark soon, but Kelly was staring into a different kind of darkness. There were so many things Danny wanted to say, but as always, when it mattered, she couldn't figure out how to assemble the words. She held Kelly's unbitten hand in her own hand and tried to squeeze some warmth into the icy fingers. All she wanted was a single sentence to come together so she could say everything she felt to Kelly, some way to express her gratitude and sorrow and love. Her mind was racing. She had to think of the words. All her skill at coming up with plans and stratagems on the fly, reacting like lightning no matter what happened, and here she couldn't come up with a simple statement that folded all the important things up into a small bundle Kelly could take with her when she went away. Then it occurred to her. It was so obvious she hadn't thought of it. I love you, she said. But Kelly was already gone. Danny picked up the gun. She felt for a pulse. There was none. No breath escaped the lips. Kelly was dead, and the thought, always present, hit Danny with new force because at last it was true. Danny fell back on her haunches and looked up at her sister's corpse, face slack, head tipped into the corner of the chair, as if Kelly had only fallen asleep in the car with her head against the back seat window, the way she often did when she was a small girl. She had fallen asleep like that when they drove down to the go-kart place in the flatlands for Kelly's birthday. She had graduated to the front seat by then. Danny wished she could take her sister somewhere again. She wished everything, more wishes than fishes, more wishes than stars, as their mother had said an eternity ago in a different world. The wishes collapsed into tears, and Danny fell forward and sobbed in her sister's lap, a lifetime of scalding, unshed tears pouring from her eyes. But there was no time for grieving any more. It was that kind of world. Danny scrubbed her face on her sleeve, smearing the wet from her eyes and nose. The first of the three choices had already passed. Kelly lived until she died. Danny could shoot her sister's corpse in the head while she was still in the brief, blessed death between, or she could wait until reanimation. Danny thought it would be best if she pulled the trigger on the lifeless shell rather than executing the alien, deadly thing her sister would become. It was time. She cocked the gun with her stump hand and looked up once more at her sister. Too late, said the voice in Danny's head. Always too late. The second choice had also passed. That leaden look had come to the flesh. The undead eyes opened, murky and dull, they wandered, 
then located Danny and fixed upon her. Danny raised the pistol and placed it up under her sister's chin. Kelly's slate gray lips parted and spoke. I'm still me, she whispered. This concludes Rise Again. Please visit our website, www.tantor.com, for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Or call toll-free 877-7-TANTOR to request a catalog. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.